please, please. Shh. Welcome to Knowing Me, Knowing You, Knowing Me, Alan Partridge, Knowing You, the you, the audience uh, here in the studio, or you, the you, the listener at home, in the car, or somewhere else, but with a radio. <laughs> Those of you who know me from the world of sport will know that I like having a bit of a chat with brawny men on the rugby field and uh, having a bit of a chat with the soft, fair, waif like moist creatures who you find in ladies' sports. Uh, <laughs> please don't write in saying that's, saying that's sexist. Uh, it's not. So, uh, <laughs> what better place to uh, continue that chat than here on a chat show? My show, my own show. My first guest, he's one of the world's great heavyweights, not in the boxing sense, he's 67. <laughs> but intellectually speaking, he's a novelist, his new novel, The Soul of Time, weighs in at nearly eight pounds, 950,000 words of thick, dense type, all telling a story about, well, let's get the potted version from the man of letters himself. Dip thy quill and clappeth loud for Britain's greatest living novelist, Lawrence Camley. <laughs> oh. Knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Lawrence Camley. Aha. Welcome. <laughs> Glad to have you on the show. Now, I've got to say, first reaction to your book. Don't drop it on my foot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, uh, it is a heavy book, but if I may be so bold, there are, uh, of course, certain literary precedents. One thinks of Proust, La Recherche, Tom Perdu, uh, Dante's Divina Commedia, uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which I'm reliably informed could cripple one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe that's what happened to Lord Byron. <laughs> Why? What, what happened to him? <laughs> the, he had a clubbed foot. Right. <laughs> um, the Soul of Time. That's the name of your book. It sounds a bit deep, is it? Well, it's, it, it is a serious novel. I, I deal with the great uh, contemporary themes, but uh, I like to think there are one or two jokes in it oh, as great. well. Oh, great. Go on, tell us a joke. <laughs> I like to start the show with a joke. It's always great yeah. to get it off on the... See, I've got myself in sticky, sticky mud already. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not jokes in the traditional knock-knock sense. They're more uh, comic vignettes woven into the general fabric and architecture of the novel. It's more funny peculiar than funny ha-ha, that, isn't it? <laughs> what I want to ask you is, and this is a question we're dying to ask you, if you were stuck in a lift, what, w what one book would you have with you? Well, I would actually choose, for sheer bloody-minded entertainment value, I would be stuck in a lift with the Hound of the Baskervilles. But I don't believe it's Sherlock Holmes! Now you're making sense. I am his number one fan. He, he, I've read all his books. Yes, I, I've read them. I, I've read all of them. Have you yes, read all yes, of them? Probably not all of them. I've read all of them. <laughs> read all of them. <laughs> Love Sherlock Holmes. Got all his books uh, leather-bound. What I thought was great about Sherlock Holmes was that not only was he a, a, a super sleuth, he was also a hard worker, because not only did he go out and solve the crimes, he came home and wrote it all down. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that, that's why I admire him. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I've always thought it was a shame that Conan Doyle had to kill him off. Yeah, I think you'll find it was Moriarty that killed him. So. <laughs> Yes, I know, but ultimately, of course, it was Conan Doyle. No, it was Moriarty. It was definitely. <laughs> yes, I know, in the books, it was Moriarty, but, of course, the ultimate responsibility was Conan Doyle's. Yeah. Hang on. As far as I know, Moriarty acted alone. Or did he? This is interesting. You, you think that there was some sort of conspiracy <laughs> involving this shadowy Doyle figure? All, all right. OK, fair enough. Who solved all the cases? Sherlock Holmes. Exactly. Yes, but the... The, <laughs> the cases were fictional, too. It's all make-believe. All right. Who lived on Baker Street? I don't know. Moriarty? No. Did the, did the Doyle live there? The Doyle... The Doyle is the Irish Parliament. <laughs> the Irish Parliament? <laughs> this conspiracy is getting bigger. You can't trust anyone these days. You've got the Doyle, Murray, the Irish Parliament. It's a, no, on that no, bombshell. No, no, uh, no. Well, it will no, move I'm, on. So, I'm sorry, Alan. I, 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 I'd like to let this go, but I, I, I really can't. Sherlock Holmes did not exist. <laughs> he did. <laughs> 
Look, if he had existed, how would he have been able to describe in intimate detail the circumstances of his own death? <laughs> um... The Nobel Prize for Literature! You never won it! What went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> you are an extraordinary man, Mr Partridge. Uh, I am an artist, and I don't write for prizes or acknowledgement. I write to satisfy my muse. It's a big fish. Your net's full of holes. <laughs> All nets are full of holes. <laughs> Granted. Granted, but your... your holes are too big to catch the Nobel Peace Prize fish of literature. <laughs> this... this cleverness thing, it re I want to get to the bottom of this. Being clever. Do you know what? I reckon that we could ask you any question and you'd know the answer. I'm... Anything. I am not a puppet. Let's just try that. I reckon if we went to the audience, got them to ask you a question, you'd know the answer. Let's... I, I will not take part in this Let's ridiculous just charade. He's a bit modest. Let's... I'm just going into the audience here. So, what question do you want to ask? What is the capital of Kenya? Good question. What's the capital of Kenya? Do you I, know the answer? I have already told you I refuse to participate in this ridiculous charade. Fair enough, but it's not the answer. <laughs> What's the capital? Come on. I you know, know the answer. You I'm don't. Not he going doesn't to tell know. You. I do he know the answer. Know. I do know the answer. What's the answer? It's bloody Nairobi. Well done. <laughs> That's really well done. Once more. There he is. You know, he could get a lot of work on the uh, conference circuit doing clever stuff like that. Listen, that's all we've got time yes. for. We've got another question about your dog here, but there's no time for no, that. No so, time. a big, another big round of applause for Lawrence Camley, a clever man. Now, my next guest is a woman who first stamped her feet with the women's movement 18 years ago. Her book, Livid Doll, was read by angry, angry and irritable women alike. Since then, she's written for journals as varied as Woman's Own and the Radio Times. And <laughs> now she hosts the hugely popular therapy show, Problem People, on cable TV. Please welcome the intelligent and not unattractive Ali Tennant. <laughs> Hello, Ali. I've just come out to meet you here um, for the listeners. Now, listen, you've got something very special for us today, haven't you? I've actually got two very special people with me. They are Linda and Peter. Hi, Linda and Peter. And they're two people who are currently working with me on my therapy show, Problem People on Cable TV. Right, so these are two of the disturbed people that you... No, no, no. They're not it's very important. They're not disturbed people. They're normal people with normal problems. Right, um, so if anyone's concerned, these two are just a bit harmless. Right. OK, <laughs> right. So um, what are you going to do with them? Well, I'm going to just do a, a brief demonstration of the kind of therapy that we work on. Good, you've got your plug in there. I'll leave it in your capable hands, Ali Tennant and the two disturbed people. <laughs> OK. Hello, Linda. Hello. Hello, Peter. Hi. Um, now, we've been working together um, on my three-point therapy plan, and I'll just run through that very quickly. The three points are the birthing of the emotions, the dialoguing about those emotions, and finally, pledging towards a better future. So, let's begin with birthing. Linda, would you like to birth your emotions, please? Yeah, um, anger, frustration, jealousy, mm -hmm. loathing, bitterness, um, deep resentment, and um, bit hate. Of, bit of inner turmoil? Yeah, inner turmoil, yeah. yeah. Inner turmoil, yeah. Thank you very much, and well done. Peter, would you birth your emotions, please? Yeah, it's the same, really. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but no loathing. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, and well done. Phase three, Linda, sex with Peter. Well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, it's just not happening. I mean, it hasn't been happening for a very long time. 
Well done. Peter, sex with Linda? Well, it's not happening for me either, is it? <laughs> well, I mean, that's because you're never there. What do you mean I'm never there? I, I sleep Can I just in the say something? That he comes, often comes back smelling of dog. Oh, come on, don't start with the dog again. Every time OK, end of dialogue. Very good, well done. We've reached pledging time. Um, We've got about a minute. OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, Peter, we're going to start with your pledge. I'd like you to say, in front of all these people here and all the people who are listening at home, that's about 13 million people rooting for you, OK? <laughs> I want you to say, I pledge to spend more time with Linda and more time with baby Sam. Samuel. Whatever, OK? <laughs> and that is my pledge. Um, Will you say that now, yeah. please? Um, I pledge to spend more time with Linda and with Samuel. And that is my pledge. That is my pledge. Well done, Peter. Well done. <laughs> Marvellous. Well done. OK, we're nearly at a resolve. Um, Linda, it's your turn to pledge. I want you to pledge now. I pledge to spend more time with myself and to take a lover to ease my frustration. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on okay. a moment. No, no, we're not dialoguing. I, no, I, don't think I, pledge to, to, I pledge to spend more time with myself and to take a lover to no, ease my frustration. Just, that is this my, pledge. my pledge. Oh, well pleasure. done, Linda. That's marvellous. Well done. Well done, Linda. That's brilliant. Great right okay. stuff. Hang on. I'm just coming over to meet them now. That was absolutely fabulous. Thanks, you two, for uh, doing your pledging and stuff. I hope you're not so disturbed anymore. Let's uh, <laughs> say, say goodbye to you. And hello to Ali Tennant. Please, come and take a seat. Come and sit down. Just sit there. Right. Sit down. Now, now, Ali, was that good therapy or balmy old cack? Well, what... <laughs> I'll leave it for you to decide, really. I mean, your audience saw it work, so... Um... Right, and you've got a pretty successful success rate. Very successful. <laughs> There are people queuing up for the cable TV show, which I right. think is incredibly brave. Absolutely of fantastic. Them. Well, I've got. Uh, let me give you a little problem. Mm -hmm. Let's let's say, take a hypothetical situation. You've got a bloke in his mid thirties, got a good job, maybe in the papers, maybe in the media. Who knows? <laughs> and he's got a problem at home with his wife. He's doing quite well. He's got a nice house. Nice furniture, right. world of leather sofa, yeah, yeah. Nice, <laughs> nice car, electric mm -hmm. windows, power steering, okay, yeah. central locking. <laughs> now, he thinks, he's not quite sure, but he thinks his wife's having an affair. Where's the problem? With him. With him. Right. Frankly, he's clearly paying too much attention to his material possessions. I mean, God help us, his world of leather sofa, even. Well, they're actually quite um, comfortable sofas. Well, <laughs> whatever. But, but you see the point. I yes, mean, the point you were obviously trying to make. And I don't blame her. I really don't blame her. You say it's all his fault, but let's mm -hmm. try and paint the picture more clearly. Um, <laughs> let's say she never talks to him. She's always going out to fitness twice mm -hmm. a day, every right. day. Why, why does she do it? Well, in the dialoguing phase, what we do is we'd explore why she's going out quite that frequently. And as you saw there, we give equal weight to each partner. So, <laughs> so what would happen is that she would say, I resent you spending all your time waxing your car, whatever. Yeah, yeah. He'd say, I resent you going out to fitness Fair three enough, times a but day. if this man's in the media, his car's got to look good if he's got a... You know, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, the car is, is obviously just, just, just an love. example. Yeah, but I mean, but, if, but she... if the car was maroon, say, that looks terrible when it's dirty. Well, it's yeah, but I mean, we're, we're sort of... There's an example. We're getting off the point Yeah, it's just, a, just an example. Um, I mean, that, that really is the basic point. We need to just air those problems as we right. did there. Right, now, tell me about sex. I mean... <laughs> well, of course, 99% of the problems that I deal with are sexually related. Right. Clearly, that's, that's the case, even if they don't appear to be on the surface. So... Sort it out downstairs, then sort it out upstairs. That's the kind of... <laughs> that's, that's, to that's a way of putting it, yeah. Right, fine. Right. Um, if the woman in question is frequently denying sex, then clearly there's an emotion behind that, and that emotion is anger. And clearly there's an emotion coming from the man, and that emotion is fear of castration. Mm, no. 
No, it's not. Well, it's not that. No. no, that's. I mean, that's a very. Again, it's an extreme way of putting it. But it's basically impotence, fear of impotence, fear of castration. No, it's not. Now let's <laughs> let's, let's move on. Uh, you said your stuff. You've got to leave. Look at the helpline, pens, all that. Now I say I'm normal. Me, Alan Partridge, normal. Good. good. You, you, Ali Tennant, bit strange. <laughs> I read. I read in. Uh, I read a bit in your book that was highlighted in yellow by a researcher for me. That, uh, <laughs> that you're quite. You're quite into female orgasms. <laughs> you like. You like them, don't you? Well, don't. <laughs> don't you? Yes. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, I'm quite curious as a man. What Good. the female orgasm? What? Is it? I mean, I don't mean. What, I, don't, I don't mean what is. It, I don't mean what. What I mean. How? How does it manifest its self? When you hear when it when it's how? What is? What is? What is it? What is it? What is it? What, what is it? What's a female orgasm? Yes. Um, it's a very good question, actually, and the answer that I would give you is: What's a male orgasm? Describe what happens when you achieve an orgasm. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. No, honestly, I don't think so. really. No, no. Because it's very important. Just, well, just describe the process. No, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, well, no this, okay, okay, let's hatchet. leave it there. Andy it's over. Spreader. Leave it. <laughs> a great a lady or a mad old trout? You decide. Ali Harris. <laughs> Ali Tennant. <laughs> Ali Tennant. <laughs> Sorry, uh, sorry, Ali, for getting your name wrong at the end. Ali Tennant, not uh, Ali Harris. Getting names confused there, but I uh, hadn't heard of you before tonight. Now, um, <laughs> let's move on. What I want you to do, by the way, is just go and move over to the other comfy chair. Fine. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring on my next guest. What I want you to do is obviously keep quiet for a bit. Um, <laughs> and then when I've got going, chatting to my next guest, please feel free to chip in. Now, my next guest is a man who first made his name back in the 60s. He was voted Carnaby Street's Mr. Boutique of 1969. <laughs> he knew all the pop stars. He was at all the parties. Whenever David Bailey was seen with a beautiful woman, you can bet that my next guest had been there first. <laughs> These days, his retail empire is enormous. No high street is complete without its branch of wishing wells. And I... Wish him well. Super green, super sexy, eco-friendly and blooming rich. Here he is, Adam Wells. <laughs> the end of his mic's come off there. Adam Wells, welcome to the show. Cheers, cheers. It's a pleasure. Money... <laughs> Money, money, money. Must be funny in a rich man's world. <laughs> uh, you're here to launch your new drink, your new vegetable drink. Vegina. Vegina. Right. It's uh, uh, made from vegetable. It's a fizzy vegetable drink. A fizzy vegetable drink in an edible can. That's fantastic. <laughs> Now, it's going to be in the shops from next week. Go out, kids, and buy millions. All right. Buy them in buckets. Uh, right. Now, back in the 60s, yeah. that's when it all happened. Everyone was partying all night long, all day long. Wasn't it, wasn't it a great time? What was it, it all about, the 60s? It, it was great. Well, Those parties. Ali and I knew each other then, of course. Yes. Oh, yeah, very we, well, yeah. We didn't notice you at any of the parties, Alan. No, well, I was, my 60s were in Norwich, really. It was, <laughs> we kind of called it Naughty Norwich, you know. It was, oh. uh, we had a great time just partying all day long, all night long. I remember uh, during one summer, we just hot summer for about three weeks just had barbecues non-stop all the day long <laughs> amazing it sounds, it, it sounds incredible sounds, crazy it sounds fabulous yeah. Yeah. yeah I suppose you were having orgies were you <laughs> I was actually yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean we all were I mean, it was, did it you was the to, thing to do you went to an orgy I went to many yes yes well, ha, ha. they were mixed <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you start how did you, how did you have an orgy then what did you do? <laughs> Very self-explanatory. Oh, well, come on, it was 25 years ago. I can't remember the well, actual mechanics. Trying to remember. Know, I, can't remember. Blood, I, can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you ever, ever see? Uh, what? Uh, did you ever see two girls kissing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
all the time. It was very free and easy. Did you ever, did you ever kiss a bloke? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, before you made your name with your veggie shoes, you had a hit with your first wife, Eve. Yeah. Adam and Eve with that novelty hit. Yeah, I don't... Remember don't... what it was called? Oh, yeah. The Smiling Bicycle of Amsterdam. The Smiling Bicycle of Amsterdam. <laughs> well, we've got a bit of a surprise for you because we're going to play that oh, no. record that reached number Don't embarrass 23 me. in the charts. Oh, no. 24 years oh, ago. Let's hear it. I haven't heard it for years. Listen to this. Take a bus, don't take a tram. You're my girl, and happy I am. You're my baby, it's a real one. Bam. I'm the smiling bicycle of Amsterdam. Tickets, please. Room for one more pixie. Fantastic. Well, give her a round of applause. Oh, oh God. That Send is me in. Certainly brings you back are, memories you are, for me. You are a naughty man. That is just so embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. So embarrassing. I uh, know, but pl let me just say thanks once again for bringing that copy in. We couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot for that. Now, um... Now, the, uh... That was, that was then. This is now. Is it? Now, yes. Shh. Now, <laughs> wishing wells... There's a wishing well on every street... Adam Wells Shop, Wishing Wells, nice link with your name there, on every street. What's the concept behind it? Because it's a very different from normal shops, isn't it? It's That's very right. different. It is very different. I invented the slogan for Wishing Wells back in 71, uh, at the time I had a boutique on the King's Road called Flair. And uh, in 71 I thought, now nah, I'm going to branch out. And I came up with a slogan which was, No tree has died, no child has cried, to make the product that you have bied. <laughs> and that slogan, that ethos, still holds true today. The, the whole thing about the shop was that we, we wanted to, like, sell cheap ethnic clobber to the masses, <laughs> but made in Britain. <laughs> so they can and buy it and not feel guilty. That's right. I don't go in there so often. I'm more a kind of Argos Ward of leather man myself. <laughs> now, you like, you like sitting on a dead cow at home, do you? As long as they've uh, cut their head off. <laughs> That'd get in the way, be flopping about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what else I bought. I bought one of those African masks. Oh, that's this... terrific. Uh, it was quite a, 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 a... It was last Halloween. I had a bit of a joke with it. So you'll like this, uh, uh, Ali. Um, <laughs> the, the, my two... My son and daughter had come home late. They've been out clubbing with their friends. And uh, Denise and Fernando came in. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> They, they walked into the living room with their friends. I think they wanted to watch a video or something. And I hid behind the curtains <laughs> with the African mask oh, on. No. And when they came in and turned the light, I jumped out and uh. said, Booga, booga, looga, I'm a big cannibal. I'm going to boil you in a pot and eat you. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they loved that. No, they found it very offensive. Said it was racist. <laughs> it was racist. Yeah, well, that's the loony tuny left. You know, you've that's... hit on my Achilles bugbear there. Yes. <laughs> You're very different, aren't I, you? I am different. Did you, did you go to... Did you study at university or...? <laughs> you know, well, you should know, that I was educated at the University of, of Life. Life. Yeah. So was I! And that's the best place. <laughs> and I graduated with flying honours. I'm so the warden I. of that university. I'm the rector. I'm the dean. Well, I'm, I'm there as well. <laughs> um, Ali, Ali, were you there? I feel terribly left out, actually. Now I was at Keele, but... Uh... <laughs> I think I'm probably doing a postgraduate course. What are O-levels? They're just bits of toilet paper. What are A-levels? Well, They're just you know, bits of luxury yeah, toilet that's paper. Yeah. Is, yeah, well, you know, I mean, I agree with you in a way. There. I mean, I've got O-levels and a couple of A-levels, but, uh, you know, maybe they're just bits of paper that you have framed in your office on either side of the... <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I've got six um, O-levels. got four, four Bs and two Cs, and uh, got a, actually got seven because I've got a, a D in French, but I retook that and... Got a B, so that's seven. <laughs> and I uh, got uh, two A-levels. I, I, I uh, took French and uh, art and general studies, but I dropped French because um, uh, it was too right. much. But I ended up with uh, a yeah. C in yeah. uh, art and uh, <laughs> B, B right. in general studies, which, of course, I'm quite pleased about. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know that, Alan. Let's give him a round of applause there. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I was out of order. I know no. it's your show, you're the boss. No, that's all right. You can say no, that. It's just, just impressive. Yeah. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> your new drink, Vegina. The advert's been banned. The new vegetable drink, Vegina, yes, there has been problems with the Advertising Standards Authority. Again, loony, tuny left, students, feminist women, whatever, whoever they are, God whatever. knows. What? But these people really just get on my breasts. I mean, they, they, they are just... Let's, let's see what yeah, the boss is about. Let's, let's hear the hear advert, the and, advert. Then, and then this is no. the band advert... That you for, won't be for, hearing. ...for the Vegina it's my drink. show, shh. Vegina. Carlos Dawson, 42. Vegina. Heart attack. Vegina. Mary Armstrong, 33. Vegina. Knocked down by a car. Vegina. Jerry Davis, 62. Vegina. Kidney disease. Vegina. Paula Wills, 5. Vegina. Never found. Vegina. Maureen Hadley, 87. Vegina. Battered. Vegina. <laughs> For life. Not death. <laughs> now, now, what? What is the problem? I, That's oh, terrible. It's a disgrace. The DTI are investigating you at the moment. Uh, might as well mention that. Um, no, why not? Why not chuck that in? Your sweatshops in Thailand. They are not sweatshops. <laughs> they are not sweatshops. Well, they are factories. Factories with 11-year-old boys working 18-hour oh, days. On, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Let, let's just get something very, very, very clear here. All right. In Thailand... An 11-year-old boy is considered, in their culture, to be a man. Oh. So when I employ an 11-year-old boy, he is, in fact, a man. I am right. employing 11-year-old men. Well, that's men. not the way Amnesty sees it, clearly. I mean, the yeah, Amnesty well, report was well, absolutely clear. Well, who are Amnesty? <laughs> no, he, that's, there's, there is a good point here, actually. Who, who is Amnesty? <laughs> I'll tell you who Amnesty is. Amnesty is five bearded, bitter hippies. Well, that's great coming from you, isn't it? Because I, when I first met you, you were a bearded hippie. Yeah, you may not have, I was you know, never bitter. Yes, you were. I was not you're bitter. bitter you're bitter now. Maybe after I met you, I was bitter. Uh, okay, that's not yeah, yeah, yeah. personal. I mean, this is not hostility here. Wait, 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 that, we listen. didn't call you Miss Lemon for Please, nothing, right, you know. Listen, let's just... Whoa! Let's cool it down now. The uh, <clears throat> We'll uh, have Amnesty on next week. With uh, Ken Dodd, hopefully. <laughs> Thailand. A bit more relaxed, the culture there, isn't it? That's that mind right. 11-year-old boys, that kind of thing. <laughs> in the, uh, Hold on, what, what are you saying? Just that, you know... No, 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 relaxed. you're always flannelling about. All what right. are you saying? All right, I'll tell you what I'm saying. Yes, what are you saying? I... Alan Partridge. Yes, I know I'm who you are. I'm saying to you... Adam Wells, you, in the 60s, you were a big shot. You, you, you went to loads of orgies with men and women at them. Yes, and you're and jealous because you, you weren't jealous. there. I was at loads of barbecues. You were all over the place seeing women here, women there, and, and dabbling all over the world. How many women Four have you wives, had, Alan? That's irrelevant. You've you had one. Yeah. So You've what? The point one. is, and I've got two strapping children to show for it, and you haven't born any children, so have what you? Is, well, right, well, what well, am I that? saying? I'm... You have been spreading your seed, but reaping no harvest. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? You're firing blanks. <laughs> you are... You are infertile. Oh, no, no, you can't... God's sake. Alan, you can't just on, that on a... And on that bombshell... You can't just on that bombshell... Alan. It's time to say that's all from the show this week. Me, Alan Partridge. Thanks to my guests, Lawrence Camley, Ali Tennant, Adam Wells, the writers and researchers, Steve Coogan, Patrick Marber, Rebecca Front, Doom McKeegan, David Schneider, and, of course, produced by Armando Iannucci. Thanks very much and good night. Well done. Great. Welcome, welcome to Knowing Me, Knowing You. And uh, the hot news is, I've got a hit on my hands. This show is a hit according to the New Statesman and Society. I don't read it myself, but uh, a researcher uh, ran into my office this week, brandishing a review. Um, the headline reads, uh, Postmodern Partridge, and it says, it says, 
Alan Partridge is the apotheosis of the three-minute culture. In his hands, the essentially complex becomes inordinately simplistic. So, uh... <laughs> On the way here, my driver, Colin, uh, dropped me off and he said, Alan, I hope you've got some good guests on tonight. And I have. This is the introduction to them. <clears throat> two times two is four. Two times four are eight. Two times eight are sixteen. Two times sixteen are thirty-two. That was about my limit when I was nine years old. But it's mere piffle to my next guest, <laughs> who is a nine-year-old child prodigy and fellow of Oxford University. <laughs> Please give an academic welcome to, with his father, Simon Fisher. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, John Fisher, aha, uh -huh. aha, uh -huh. and and you, Simon Fisher, aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. not not so loud into the microphone. Now, <laughs> now Simon, you are a fellow of Oxford University, and you're a child prodigy. As a child genius, what do you do? What do you actually do in the day? Well, I don't exactly do. I I I am. I, I see each day as a, as a sort of gift that is to be unwrapped, which I do in my own unique way. And, of course, you, you are very unique. Well, one cannot have gradations of uniqueness when either is or is not unique. Right. <laughs> oh, no, you, you're, you're right, you're right. I mean, I mean you, you couldn't be more right. Well, one is either right or not. <laughs> well, no, you are, you're right, and, and, and so am I. Um... <laughs> Now, John Fisher, yes. um, or Simon's dad, as you're more commonly known. Um, <laughs> Simon yes. is obviously a lot of fun. Yes. Um, I can see that, <laughs> see that with his little quips. But um, <clears throat> when did you first realise that Simon was abnormal? Uh, <laughs> gifted, you mean, really? Uh, abnormally gifted. Mm. Um, well, it's when Simon was about 14 months old. Um, I remember looking at him there in his cot, and um, I, I said to him, uh, Who does Daddy love, Simon? Who? Who? And uh, guess what Simon said? What? Whom does Daddy love? Whom? Whom? <laughs> he picked up on my grammatical error with his very first word, and uh, <laughs> that's when I knew he was going to be something special. <laughs> yeah, my, my son Fernando wasn't quite as original as that. He said, uh, he said Daddy which somehow I prefer. <laughs> of course, he, he was calling me father soon afterwards. Not daddy. Well, daddy's a vulgarisation. Oh, yeah. Oh, he yeah. says, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> John. John, do you ever sit alone at night by the fire with your head in your hands and think to yourself, God have mercy on my soul. I have spawned a monster. I... <laughs> I've created Frankenstein. No, no, no. I mean, Simon's a wonderful child. No, never, never. Well, that's nice. I'm sure that Frankenstein's parents found it within their hearts <laughs> to love him. Interjection. Uh, there is no such monster as Frankenstein. Uh, there is, actually. It's, it's, uh, it's in a film and it's a certificate X. You wouldn't have seen well, it. Well, I've read the book by Mary Shelley and Frankenstein is the name of a Genevan student who creates Frankenstein's monster. You only good at sport, Simon. Sport induces violence in the common man. Yeah, cobblers. I like sports and I'm not violent. You're just scared of breaking your glasses. I don't wear glasses. Well, you should. <laughs> I like sport. Um, in fact, uh, I represented my school at uh, the London School Swimming Championships when I was 15. Um, your bronze medal will probably come in a bit handy, because, uh, you know, if, if uh, Simon fell into a canal, you could dive in and save him. <laughs> yes, I certainly could. I wouldn't be could. so stupid as to fall in. No, but you might get pushed in. <laughs> Partridge, is that you think that I deserve to be pushed in the canal? So if you think I do, then who do you think should push me in? Who? Who? Whom? Whom? Uh, no, uh, in, in this context, whom, which is the uh, accusative dative, is not applicable. Is he right? Yes, he's right. I <laughs> Why don't you just say what you mean, which is that you would like to push me into a canal, Mr. Partridge? All right then. 
I, Alan Partridge, <laughs> would like to push you, Simon Fisher, into a very deep, disused canal. <laughs> There. It's not so difficult, is it? No. In fact, I feel a lot better. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very honest. I so to be honest as this world goes, is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very worthy of Shakespeare, that. Very good. It is Shakespeare. Well, it's, well, it's, well, it's better than that. It's worthy of the great bard. <laughs> Have you ever seen Hamlet? Uh, Simon yes, Hester, yes. Please. I saw it with Alan Rickman. Who did you see it with? My wife, Carol. <laughs> no, no, no. Who's playing the lead? Hamlet. Uh, oh, yes, the great actor Bert Hamlet. Simon, no, which actor on, was playing the now. lead? Um, uh, yes? Bernard Cribbins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It was a long time ago. It was before you were born. You wouldn't remember it. Have you seen Citizen Kane? Yes, I've watched every episode. Power to the people. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen Beauty and the Beast? Yes. John Cocteau's? No. Have you read Metamorphosis? Yes. Who's it by? No, I haven't read it. I've read it. <laughs> Have you read any Dickens? No. Do you go to the bank? No. Can you no. play chess? No. Do you know any Russian? Uh, no. What, no. What about you? I'll you. Anything. Right, right, you. Have, have you got any pubic hair? <laughs> No, I'm 37 and I've got plenty. All right? <laughs> Can you do this? Ah. Uh, no, because my voice has exactly. broken. Exactly. Don't forget it. And, and, and uh, one more. Are you a boy or a girl? I'm a boy. Really? My name's Simon. Really? It could be Simone. Could be Simone because you sound like a girl. I'm a boy and my yeah. name is Simon. Yeah. You've, you've got something on your shoulder there. <gasps> oh no! You've gone too <laughs> far. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. My mistake. I'm not very good with kids. It's Carol's. I've got a bad temper. But you are a little shit. <laughs> that said. That said. Thank you for coming on the show, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the Fishers. OK, now, if you just want to move chairs... Right. <clears throat> my next guest. Look into my eyes. You are feeling very sleepy. If my soothing voice is soothing enough, it should be sending you listeners at home to sleep. Are you asleep? Well, wake up, because I, Alan Partridge, am not a hypnotist. But my next guest is. I'm told she's going to hypnotise me. I might end up like one of those zombies from The Living Dead. Of course, my arms won't be dropping off. She, uh, she <laughs> hails from across the Great Lake. Good old uncle, US of stateside. She's as American as chocolate chip biscuits and mum's apple tart. But uh, that's where comparisons with a tart must end. <laughs> yes, I come to a sticky end. Ladies and gentlemen, she's not a tart. She's a lady hypnotist with a set of pins that'll hypnotise any bloke. The big question is, what's the name of her game? Please welcome Janie Katz. <laughs> Janie Katz, knowing me, Alan Portage, knowing you, Janie Katz, aha. Uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. No, aha. Uh -huh. You say aha. Uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. That's right, yes. OK, right. What's the name of your game? Is it a game? Has it got a name other than hypnotism? Really, what I practice is hypnotherapy, not hypnosis. Right. So I try to distance myself from the kind of showbiz, um, you know, the razzmatazz side of it. I'm not out to make fools of people. I'm there to use hypnotherapy as a form of uh, helping people to open up their minds. Right, because I saw a brilliant hypnotist, uh, Tony, Le <laughs> Tony Lamesma, he was called. He was brilliant. <laughs> he, he was fantastic. He had, he had blokes crying like babies. He had women on all fours barking like dogs. It was really first-class entertainment. Yeah, it I really was. <laughs> he's, uh, but he's very popular. He's booked right through till next summer. Um, Unavailable, hence your good self. Um, <laughs> now, but uh, you, you, you were in London uh, promoting your new book. That's right, yes. Well, I, I actually know New York quite well. Oh, you do? Mm, yeah. I popped over there and I, and I really did get into, uh, as, as Billy Joel put it, I really did get into a New York state of mind. Um, I bet. 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, I jumped in a cab and I said, Cabby, take me to the core of the Big Apple. I want to check out the pit. <laughs> Dude, I really did. You know, oh say that. God! Yeah. Just look. Next time, just say Manhattan, well, and you'll I, get there. No, I know. I want to go to the centre of New York. <laughs> yeah, that is Manhattan. Right. Well, that's, that's not where I want to go. <laughs> where do you want to go? Bloomingdale's. Yeah, you're in Manhattan. Right. Okay. I'm in Manhattan. What do I do now? <laughs> you just you get in the cab. And you say to the driver, take me to Manhattan, mm -hmm. to Bloomingdale's. OK, I'm, I'm outside Bloomingdale's. <laughs> what, what next? What do I do now? What do you mean? You've hypnotised me. <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh, no. I see, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought, I so said, you'll I, know, Alan. I thought you just sort of slid into it. No. <laughs> It's just that you were staring at me. Um, I'm sorry. No, I, I just find you fascinating. What? In what, in what way? <laughs> Clinically. Really? <laughs> My pleasure. You, Jenny Katz, hypnotist. I, Alan Partridge, clinically fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> now, you're... Uh, now, I believe right now I'm very fortunate because you're going to hypnotise me. I certainly am, yes. Great. Um, obviously, we don't have much time, mm -hmm. so it's going to be a, a kind of vague gesture towards it. Uh, but the idea is that what we'll try to do is to project onto, let's say, the curtain of your mind, mm -hmm. a series of images from your past. OK, well, I'll draw back my curtains. Good. <laughs> behind which you will find a neck curtain. <laughs> you may lift that up, should you wish. Thank you. And we'll see if there are any skeletons lurking in the... cupboard. The, cu the curtain. <laughs> the curtain cupboard. In your mind. My mind's curtain cupboard, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, the first thing to do is to get you relaxed. Okay. So if you can just lie on... What do you... Right, what? Just, just put this peg what? on my nose. Why are you putting a peg on your nose? Well, because I, I was told that the, the, your blood pressure increases during hypnotism and it could lead to a nosebleed. No. No. <laughs> no, it's nonsense. Who told you that? The researchers. I think it was probably a joke. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, that's all right. It's OK. Well, I mean, take it off. Well, because... I'll take it off if I wish to yeah, take it off. Yeah, you can't relax with a peg on your nose. If, I, if I shall be the judge of whether I should take the <laughs> peg off my nose, and as it happens, I have decided to take the peg off. And so <laughs> I'll do that now. <clears throat> OK, just lie back on the couch, okay. if you would be so kind. Right, I'm lying back on the couch, listeners. OK, just try to concentrate. Now, I'm going to count you down from three, and in that time, I want you to relax every muscle in your body, OK? And then you will be hypnotised. Three, two, one. Now, Alan, without opening your eyes, I want you to tell me what you can see. A pair of plimsolls. <laughs> All right, now, who do they belong to? Little boy. Do you recognise the little boy? Yes, it's Alan Partridge. Uh-huh. <laughs> Alan, I want you to just step inside Alan Partridge. OK. Now, Alan, would you tell me how old you are? I'm eight years old. <laughs> and where are you at the moment? I'm at the bottom of Tandle Hill. Where's Tandle Hill? It's near the school. OK. Now, um, describe what you can see in front of you. There's about 80 boys. <laughs> so you're not alone? No, they're at the top of the hill. And where are you? I'm at the bottom. <laughs> Can't keep up with them. It's a cross-country run. OK. It's cold. It's very cold. Why are you so cold if you're running, Alan? I haven't got any shorts on. <laughs> Why not? Stephen McCombs taking them off me. Can, can you see Stephen McCombs? Yes, he's waving them about with his hand. <laughs> he's <laughs> saying, smelly Alan Fartridge. <laughs> smelly Alan Fartridge. Yeah. I'm not smelly. No, smelly I know Alan that. Smelly Alan Fartridge. OK, Alan. <laughs> All right, now look, you're not happy, are no. you? No. No. Should we take you away from here? Yes. Let's take you someplace where you are happy. Oh, good. OK? We're going there right now. Mm. Are you there? Yes. Good. Now yes. tell me what you can see. I'm in class. 
Yeah. The headmaster's come in. Right, and what's happening? Oh, he's, he's looking very pleased. He said, he said, he said someone's won an essay writing competition. Someone's written an essay on sport and it's won a prize. Mm -hmm. What else is he saying? He said, is there an Alan Partridge in the class? Would Alan Partridge identify himself? And what's happening now? I'm standing up. And they're all applauding me. Terrific. What are you saying, Alan? I'm saying... I'm Alan Partridge. <laughs> I am Alan Partridge. I've won the essay writing competition. Of that, there's no doubt. OK, <laughs> good. I have won it. Things will now be very different. No longer will I be called infantile names because okay. I've won the competition. Great. Now, Alan, we have to, we're running a little short of time. We have to now bring you back, OK? No, I don't want to come back. No, you'll be fine. You, you have to come back because you're in the middle of a, of a talk show. I like it here. Well, you like, like it, you like it here too. No, I don't want to go back. I oh, don't want to be on the radio. Come on, Alan. You're Nobody very popular. Nobody listens to Radio come 4. On. Alan, okay. <laughs> Nobody listens to Radio 4. All right, Alan, just concentrate because I can't bring you I back. I want to be on the telly. Otherwise. So just... <laughs> okay. the telly. I'm going to count to three and you Let have to come on back. The telly. One, two, three. So what I want to know is, when are you going to hypnotise me? <laughs> I've done it. Really? Yes, it's been done. Just think about what is foremost in your mind at the moment. Oh, the essay writing competition. That's right, back at school. Anything else from school? Do you remember? Yes, cross country runs. Tandle Hill, you yeah, remember that? The great stuff, yeah. That's Lovely. right, yeah. yeah. You enjoyed Lady that? Ellen Partridge. What? <laughs> no one calls no, me that. On, no one Simon. calls me that. No. I was just referring him this back is, to his past. Simon, this is a very important point. You no. must not abuse this privilege I, because we have been privileged to see smell. inside Alan's memory. Look, no, this wanna, is irrelevant, no, Alan. You don't have to defend no, yourself. No, I want to clear this up once and for all. This has, no been, this has been hanging in the air okay. for about 30 okay. years, right? <laughs> Clear it up, OK? That, Stephen McComb called me smelly Alan Partridge because he thought it was funny, Partridge, I mean, Partridge, he said smelly. I wasn't, my personal hygiene was never in question. I showered regularly, I was never, I didn't smell. The question is, what's Stephen McComb doing now? That's the question, because I host a chat show. What's he doing? I'll tell you what, he's a forklift truck driver with British Leyland. <laughs> I'll tell you what, he lives in Edge Baston. He's got a pathetic life. I've, see, I've parked my car outside his house. I've watched him come and go there. <laughs> And he's got a sad, pathetic life. And McComb, if you're listening, what are you now? You're nothing. And I am Alan Partridge. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, now, you, uh, that sort of about wraps it up. Now, your book's available in the, in the shops this Christmas. It's not a very good advert for my book. I assure you, it does not make you this aggressive. OK, well... Um, yeah, it's called The Future is Behind You, and it is, in, in fact, a therapeutic study. OK, one for the Christmas stocking. Hypnotise your friends. No, no, it's not a show. It's not a party trick. Well, OK, in that case, a very serious book. Slap it on top of uh, Stephen Hawkins' book on your coffee table and uh, impress your friends. Ladies and gentlemen, Janie Katz. Now, order, order, silence in court, order, order, silence in court. <laughs> of course, I don't say things like that, but my next guest does, because he is a lawyer. <laughs> not, but not just any old lawyer, he's a young lawyer, who's known as the bad boy of the old Bailey, famous for his natty dress sense and his unconventional behaviour in court. Let us court the enfant terrible of the inner temple. Do you want to get to know him? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Voulez-vous? <laughs> OK. Voulez-vous, Nick Ford? <laughs> sit down there. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Just sit there. Um... I don't, I don't know what... Knowing me, knowing you, aha. Uh -huh. No, there can be no ahas. Uh There's been a dreadful error here. You were supposed to come on to Voulez Vu by ABBA. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Because I thought the law by the clash. Thank Well, how do you know that? Well, I was come on in court to I fought the law by the clash. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer. You know, it's kind of cool. Yeah, but how, how did it get on here? 
I well, just asked the sound guy to play, you know, I thought it'd be cool. And he just said he'd do it, he didn't say he had to go to anyone else to ask permission. <laughs> no, I just said, slap this one, mate. He said, yeah, cool. No, well, it's not, it's not your fault. I'm not saying it is. No, it's not your, it's not, it's not your job that's uh, on the line. <laughs> Let's just start again, all right? With the music. <clears throat> I'll do it. <clears throat> Boulez-vous! Aha! Take it now or leave. Aha! Now it's all we gain. Aha! Nothing promised, no regrets. Da ba da ba da ba 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 da ba. Voulez-vous? Aha! Nick Ford. <laughs> Welcome to knowing me, knowing you, knowing you. Aha! Aha! I understand the way you yes. work now. Right now we've got a rapport. Indeed. Now, you are... Right. You are a very different kind of lawyer. That's right. Yeah. What I say is like, you know, like the law is an ass and I kick it. Very good. Very clever. <laughs> yeah. Now, you've done all sorts of things in court. You've, you once abselled into court. Uh-huh. You once did a partial strip. That's right. And you once simulated a heart attack. Yeah. The, the one that was in the press recently is um, the robber, the man who robbed the... Mickey Hall. Basically what happened was he'd, he'd robbed a building society and I felt that there were mitigating circumstances. And so uh, when it came to the summing up, I kind of uh, went in there with all the jewellery on, all the gear, and a, a baseball cap with justice written on it. Very and uh, I just got them to dim all the lights, one centre spot on me. And I went, ladies and gents of the jury... Everybody in the court, hear me one and all. I'm here to plead the case of a guy called Mickey Hall. When he went into the Woolwich on that fateful day, he was an innocent man. He didn't blow no one away. Yeah, he pulled a gun, but the gun was fake. On that piece of evidence of stake, my claim, society's to blame. Look at his face. I rest my case. Very good. I rest my case. Yeah. I rest my case. Yeah. Said it. I said it three times and then I just very, very slowly, very dramatically walked backwards into my seat, sat down, the atmosphere was electric. Could have heard a pin drop, man. Amazing. What happened? He got five years. <laughs> well, good for you. Right, well, he won't be doing that again in a hurry, no, would he? I was defending him, Alan. I lost the case. It puzzles me about the law. How can you defend a man who, let's say, has been arrested for murder? Well, because he may be innocent. Well, well, with the greatest respect, the police are hardly likely to arrest him if he's innocent, are they? <laughs> With slightly less respect, uh, <laughs> haven't you heard of wrongful arrest? No. Guildford 4, Birmingham 6. Well, yes, but that, no, that's, that's diff- I mean, now, now, they are innocent. <laughs> but be then... Very, be very careful, Alan, you're on air. No, I think we should, we should go into no, this. if it's, I was your lawyer, I would advise you very strongly now yeah. to shut your mouth. Why? <laughs> These people will sue and put an injunction on your show and you'll never broadcast again. Where did you get your shirt? <laughs> it's, uh, my friend Domo made it. Not so much a shirt, more a sort of... It's a blouse. I think that's the word you're blushingly well, groping. Blushing. <laughs> yeah, it's blushing. a big girl's blouse, well, kind of Errol Flynn. Look, look if you don't like it, you can be honest. This is my whole philosophy. This is what I'm saying, gang. It's like, you know, if there was more honesty and less repression in our society, there'd be less crimes. That's the whole all right, point. All right, all right, I'll be honest. Be honest. I'll be honest. You are a homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> Bisexual. Don't pussyfoot. I'm not pussyfoot. The point is, there are blokes... Involved. That's the important. <laughs> I mean, you seem very threatened by it, Alan. No, I'm not threatened by you lot. No way. <laughs> Any of you lot had a go, I'd deck the lot of you. <laughs> oh, a tough guy. I meant psychologically threatened. Well, whatever. It's okay to explore your sexuality. You know, it's okay to be open. I mean, you know, there's a kid here, Simon, let's bring him into it. I mean, you're just discovering sexuality. You know, no, I'll he's leave got the, the right kid out tune. of it. Leave him out of it. Well, maybe you should have left him out just of it Just cover his ears. Yeah, well, his ear is still bright red from where you hit it. That Alan. was... That you know, was... By the way, Mr Fisher, if you're seeking legal advice on this, if you want to... I don't need any advice from your sort. Thank oh, well, welcome to, welcome to Homophobics Anonymous. Good, good one. I like that, Mr Fisher. Don't want any advice from your sort. <laughs> from your sort. Nice. We should go for a drink sometime. <laughs> no, thanks. You're hitting kids. You know, you could end up in jail. Uh, can I just you? say something here? Oh, no, because... No, please. 
because technically it wasn't assault because he didn't actually cause any any It was bodily assault. Harm. He no, hit you. Assault. Yes, but assault. I was provoking him. I was being precocious. <laughs> the point is, if this was a normal child, I am uh, normal. You are not normal. You're a freak. If this was, <laughs> if this was a if this was a normal child with a normal father, they would sue you immediately. You should be careful. I don't think you'd like it in prison, all those men. Listen, what are you insinuating? What are you saying? Are you saying that I, Alan Partridge, <laughs> would end up in prison and maybe, what, get friendly with some bloke? Who knows, And Alan? maybe I'd be in the shower with him and... And, and, and maybe we'd just start wrestling and mucking about, and and then he'd probably start soaping my back down, and and then you know we'd kiss each other tenderly. Is that what you're saying? Because, because that is untrue. It's that, that all is... in your imagination, Alan. Well, if you're insinuating that's what I secretly want. No further questions, Your Honour. No further questions. <laughs> well, um, my researcher said. Um, you can get him on this question. <laughs> it says it. Very much doubt. Well, I'll read it out. Why does he affect a Cockney accent when he went to Harrow, brackets, which is a public school? <laughs> um, so, my question to you is, why do you affect a Cockney accent when you went to Harrow, which is a public school? I think that I don't. I wouldn't say it's affected. I think that um, you know. No further you, questions, you, Your Honour. <laughs> yes. Can I just say something here? Yeah. Yeah, right. Because I think we are all here as 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 fine-minded people, and and we're we're sort of wallowing about in a mire when all the beautiful things we could be talking about and and music and art, and we're on this tawdry show. Yeah, it's and not a tawdry show. It is. It is a tawdry show. Is it? And Mr. Ford is debasing. Beautiful oh, language. Oh, yeah. shut up! Look, can we do just it again? flushing psychotherapist. Look, uh, what? Can, can yeah. we have order? Order. Order. She thinks that we need to go and have our heads examined. Yes, sir. Well, well, if you think we need therapy, then to who should we go? To who? To who? To who? Hang on a second. <laughs> Surely that should be to whom? Yeah, he's right. In this to context, whom? it is to, to whom. No, yeah. You're wrong! To whom? To whom? Who? 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 I have wet myself, Daddy! Oh, dear. And on that bombshell, we say goodnight as Simon Fisher, nine-year-old fellow of Oxford University, has wet himself. <laughs> And I, now, Alan Partridge, dry as a bone, <laughs> saying, knowing me, knowing you, would like to thank my guests, Janie Katz, Mad Hippie, Nick Ford, Queer Lawyer, Simon Fisher, Wet Boy and his dad, a nobody. Thanks to the writers and researchers, Steve Coogan, Patrick Marber, Doom McKeegan, Rebecca Fronts, and David Schneider. And to my producer, Armando Iannucci. Thank you. Welcome to Knowing Me, Knowing You. Now, I have a letter here from a listener, Mr Tim Stringer. It says, Dear Alan, I love the show, but please could you tell me, is your theme tune, Knowing Me, Knowing You, available on record? <laughs> if so, who's it by? <laughs> Yours sincerely, Tim Stringer. Well, Tim, Knowing Me, Knowing You was uh, originally recorded by the Swedish power pop combo, ABBA. Uh, sadly, no longer with us, but uh, the version we use, we, uh, we use instead a version of the song recorded by the Jeff Love Orchestra, which uh, I have to say, in my opinion, is superior in essence to the actual version. <laughs> so uh, I hope that answers your question, Tim. My first guest tonight is, I have to say, The Pits. That's a joke. Because, because 
It's a joke with a point, because I met him in the pits at the Monaco Grand Prix, because he is France's second best racing driver. He's sophisticated, he's suave. Please give a loud cheer and cry de coeur for second best French racing driver, Le Trébon Michel Lambert. <laughs> Knowing me, knowing you, aha. 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 <laughs> or, uh, or should I say, je sais moi, Alan Partridge, je sais toi, Michel Lambert. Oh ho. <laughs> <laughs> now, you are a celebrity. You're France's second best racing driver. You get interviewed all the time. Do you get bored of the same old questions? Yes, that's very true. There's nothing worse than uh, an interviewer who cannot be bothered to find uh, an interesting angle. You know? Yeah, I can imagine. When did you first want to be a racing driver? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. yes. Yes, exactly when? <laughs> well, <if> you... <laughs> well uh, ironically, Alan, uh, I never wanted to be a racing driver. I actually wanted to be a chat show host like you. <laughs> But I turned up to the wrong job interview and pff, I ended up as a racing driver. That can't be true. No, it's not. It's a joke. <laughs> of course, the famous uh, French sense of humour there. <laughs> now, <laughs> you're nearly at the top of your profession and what I want to know is how do you cope with the pressure? I take a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. M Michelle, in, in this country, drugs are frowned upon, so better not to mention them. Yeah. I was joking, Alan. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you joke in future, could you wink at me or something? <laughs> so let me know. Okay. They, they won't notice it's radio. It's fine, OK. <laughs> right, now, what do you think about when you're racing your car? What do you think about? Surprisingly, uh, I think about the race. Right. Um, what do you think about when you're interviewing someone? Well, nothing. I mean... <laughs> see. But, uh, but do, do you, when you're driving along, do you ever think, oh, sacrable, I've forgotten to set the video to record, I don't know, Top Gear? <laughs> what, is, uh, what is Top Gear? Uh, it's not, uh, uh, all right, then. Um, you've forgotten to tape uh, Serrano de Bergerac with Gerard Jeopardy. <laughs> Depardieu. 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 De. De. Par. Par. Dieu. 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 It's not important, Alan. Right. I think, uh, I think what you're trying to ask me is, do I ever get distracted when I'm driving? No, I don't. No, 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 no. I'm quite specifically asking you, do you forget to tape Serrano de Bergerac with... With uh, Gerard Depardieu. Him, yeah. No, I don't ever forget to tape it because I saw it at the cinema when it came out. Right. Have you ever seen this film? Yes, yes, I did see it. No. You like it? I'm not so keen on it. I mean, I don't like what they did with the idea. They said in the 17th century, gave him a long nose. <laughs> Maybe it was made it a bit funnier, but, but for the British, you know, Bergerac is John Nettles. <laughs> I, I, I thought you ruined it, really. I'm just glad you uh, haven't got your hands on Lovejoy. <laughs> Probably said it in the future. And, uh, when, of course, antiques will be even more expensive. <laughs> Not a bad idea, wouldn't it, really? And uh, the question is? The, the question is, yes. Um, right. Are you, are you winking at me? No, I was sniffing. All oh, right. Because I take drugs. <laughs> Do you really? No, I was winking. <laughs> See, I managed to sniff and wink at the same time. It's a French trick. Very clever. Um, <laughs> now, well... Uh, I don't mean to be rude, but I think we're, uh, we're, we're wasting our time here. Uh, right? Well, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> if we're wasting anyone's time, which... I concede we may be, <laughs> then it's the listeners. Yes, but uh, at least the listeners have the opportunity to turn their radios off. No, wrong again. You see, a recent survey reveals most of my listeners are infirm. Or... 
with Alan, they could at least bash the radio with their walking sticks. No, you know, no. They can escape. A lot of hospitals have it piped in. They have no control. <laughs> Oh, I've got a list of questions as long as the channel tunnel here, and I'll... Well, just you... get right, through them. Right, OK, now, right. What's your favourite colour car? <laughs> Have another go, Alan. Right. Um, OK, fair enough. What's your favourite haute cuisine? Hot food. <laughs> oh... But there is some bad Encore, questions. Encore, Alain. Encore. Okay, right. There's quite a few. I'll just read through them all. You stop me if you like one. Okay. Fine. <laughs> right. What's the biggest road you've driven on? <laughs> What's the furthest you've driven without stopping? <laughs> no? Uh, What's the fastest car you've driven? What's the slowest car you've driven? <laughs> well, we quite never twist on that. Alan, just read the questions. I'll stop you oh, when it's appropriate. Right. Do you own a bicycle? <laughs> Do Formula One cars use unleaded petrol? No, they use leaded petrol. Right. No, there's no conversation there. That's right, nice. OK. Uh, have you ever driven a lorry? Have you ever driven a tractor, a minibus, a, a tank, a taxi, a rocket? <laughs> What's your favourite mode of transport? Land, sea, air? When you crashed three years ago, did you ever consider... Giving up motor racing for good? No, I didn't. Next question. No, no I wasn't going to say that. No, you weren't. You no, had I was a more original say, question. Yes, I was yes. going to say, did you ever consider the scenery? <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. Yes, I did. I looked no, out of the no, window and I no, thought, I oh, look at the scenery. I, I wasn't... No, going you weren't. No, I wasn't. I'm, right. How long no, more got, have you got to kill, Alan? I've got two minutes, now. You got any more questions? No, I've run out. <laughs> now, there is a, a traditional French custom. We always give our guests uh, special French smelling salts. So I have some yes. here. You want to take these, put them in, in your nose and well, open this is... up this little package here. Right, this is a, this is a French smelling salt. Yes, it's a traditional French ritual. Okay. What do I do? I'll just now? roll up this tampon note. Oh, the generation mm -hmm. game, isn't it? Just roll that up so mm -hmm. it's kind of like a straw. Right. You see this line here? Just yes. sniff that line. I'll put yeah. this... What? What do we do with this? Put it up your nose. Right. You sure? <laughs> yes, it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's good for you. I feel okay. really good. And what do I do now? Just sniff it up. Right. Through there. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Well, that's... And, the, and the other nostril. Yeah, OK. Right. That's good. Hmm. Well, thank yeah, you. It's nice. Nice yeah. ritual. <laughs> and you'll find in about 20 minutes' time you feel really good and kind of up. You know. Thanks for the smelling salts. Feeling better already. Um, <laughs> and uh, now, time for me to say to you, uh, merci beaucoup, au revoir, Michel Lambert. <laughs> Great. What a nice, what a nice man. Now, my next guest is a woman who is always popping up. And popping out, if you've seen her chest. <laughs> She's a friend of the stars and has a story for everyone. If British industry had half her energy, we wouldn't be in a recession. I'm exaggerating, of course. <laughs> but please give a round of applause as hopefully I get a kiss and a cuddle from Shirley D. You've got here, aren't they? Yes. Lovely. Oh, I'm so proud to be here, Alan. You are right. so lovely. Any gorgeous girls? Don't you think put on a bit of weight, though, since I last saw bit. you, haven't you? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, darling, right. what do you want to ask Move. me? Now. Um, right. <laughs> knowing me, you have Al to shut me up yeah. because I will just All carry right. on. Knowing, you know? me, knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Shirley D. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Right, oh, right. I just love it. It's yeah. such a brilliant catchphrase. This now, is a wonderful yeah. program, yeah. darling, because right. it is yeah. just yeah. wonderful. All right, come on. Really. Come on. Sorry, Come darling, on. I'm going yeah, on again, aren't I? Getting a bit tiresome. Yeah. <laughs> now, oh, shut now, up. Right. I'm terrible. Right. Now, let yeah. me ask you a I'll question. I wear myself out. Yes, yeah. darling. Now, you, you can't half talk. <laughs> I know. I'm terrible. I mean, you should have known that. You should have been forewarned because you see me mm. in hospitality with that French geezer who's yes. also a bit of a looker, any girls, eh? Oh, <laughs> I might have heard that one. But, yeah. um. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you saw me. He, I was nattering away. He, 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 under, he understood your Cockney accent, then. No, we were talking in French, darling. Yeah, we were really? having a right old natter. Marvellous. Too, too par français. 
Ooh, yeah, I do a bit. So do you, by the sound of it? Oui, oui, un peu. Oh, oui, oui, oui bien sûr, évidemment, je parle français. Je passe souvent mes vacances en France. Ooh, très bien. <laughs> Mais euh, bien sûr, un homme sophistiqué comme toi, mm. Alain, tu connaîtrais la France super bien. Oui, oui, très bien. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you've got to watch me, oh. no, seriously, Alan, because I will take over. I mean, I really will. In a couple of weeks' time, there'll be knowing you, knowing me with Shirley D, you know. <laughs> I won't no, 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 that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> now, you... Let's, let's not beat about the bush. You are 52. I'm nearly 53, darling. Yeah. But you've still got an eye for the fellas. I certainly have, not just an mm. eye at all. <laughs> and uh, presumably now, of course, you, the added bonus of not having to worry about getting pregnant. <laughs> yeah, that, that, is, that is... Yeah, it's true. Right. He comes out with them, yeah, doesn't he, right, eh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming no. down with a bit of a cold, darling, isn't Yeah, it's all right. I took some smelling salts before. The <laughs> now, the thing about you is you're very difficult to categorise so. because on, on one minute you'll be on Celebrity Squares and the next day you're on Give Us a Clue. That's right. Do yeah. you see what yeah. I mean? That is my favourite. And then suddenly you'll turn up on Blankety Blank. Yeah. So now... The, the, the great thing at the moment is that they're, uh, they are making a film. Yeah. About me, darling. About you, Hello. set in the 60s. Yeah. Uh, it's called Our Shirley. I know, I'm ever so proud. And it's about all the people you knew. That's that right, whole... it's about the East End in the, in the 60s, yeah. Right. And I'm in the film, but I'm not playing myself. No, it? Uh, Which is Helena Bonham Carter is playing you. <laughs> yes. The young me, yeah. Which I thought was ever so ever so weird when I heard about it. Yes, you wanted to get away from playing the sort of flowery types and yeah. play someone a bit bit rougher. Um, <laughs> well, she's ever so good, darling. She's marvellous. And, 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 and of course, Tom Bell is plays in the me, film. Uncle Dennis. Yes, yeah. <laughs> because I very good at playing those shady. Types. Well, what Tom Bell has got is the warmth, the magic of of my Uncle Dennis. This wonderful, kind, lovely, nice, nice man. Well, you oh, see, it's so exciting for me, darling. Yeah, I know. You, now you say nice, but your Uncle Dennis did commit murder. <laughs> Served his sentence. Yes, he did. I mean, he was in with a dodgy crowd. It was the East End, you know. Right, to okay. me, it was well, lovely. Well, with that in mind, I have here a pathologist's report. <laughs> oh, um, God, darling, I mean, well, he has I, been tried. He served know, his time. I know, It's a 40-page report condensed into uh, this, this paragraph here, and it's by Home Office pathologist, and it says, Re Mickey Rowlands, the victim. The victim was subject to what I can only describe as a barbaric and frenzied attack. He incurred multiple fractures to the ribs and skull and sustained massive internal injuries due to multiple stab wounds. It was a combination of organ malfunctions and loss of blood which led to death from heart failure. The victim's disfigurement was such that identification was only possible with reference to dental records. Now, there's nice and there's nice and there's Uncle Dennis. You know... He did a bad thing, a very bad thing. Identification he, yes, only I possible. Know, Alan. <laughs> he went to, to prison, he records. served his time, and he regrets it. That is all Massive I can say. Massive internal and now he's in... <laughs> Don't go on, Alan. He's, he's a reform man. Organ I mean, malfunction. Yeah, I know. It was a terrible thing. It was a terrible case. Barbaric. Everybody knows the details. It was famous at the time, but... Frenzied attack. You know, it's over, darling. You can't live in the past, really. I'm not defending him, but... But, you know, okay. you've got to live, All you've right. got to carry on living. Organ malfunctions. <laughs> now, but uh, you, you're not in contact with him anymore. Which yes, is... I am, darling. Really? Of course I am. I mean, he was like a father to me. I go and see him every Christmas. He lives on the Costa. We go, we spend Christmas with him. It's marvellous. Right, and he follows everything you do. He, he watches... Yeah, he watches everything I'm on on telly, all the programmes. He listens to everything. He'll be listening. Hello, Uncle Dennis. He'll be listening He'll now. He's probably to this. out on the World Service, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, of course he will. He never but, misses a trick. He doesn't... He, he doesn't run that boxers club anymore. Yeah, you know really? about that. Yes, he does. Oh. Boys club on the Costa. Those boys, he drags them up from nothing, and they would do anything for him. Him. They go to the ends of the earth. It's marvellous, really. really. It's really sort of warming to see. Um, he will realise, if, if he's listening, he will realise that that was just a joke, reading that before. <laughs> uh, if he's listening, I'll address him directly. Um, Alan, there's no, no. need. It was Wait, just a no. joke. Dennis, if you're listening. Alan? Um, 
I have to say this. Dennis, it was, um, it was just a joke. I'll probably edit it out. Don't... It's no reflection on you. I realise it was a long time ago, and, and things in the past should be dead and buried. Um, I, I, it's an unfortunate <laughs> phrase there, uh, but I... Alan, I don't, leave wait, it, no, I've got to say this. You know, it was a long time ago. You, it was, you lost your temper, you murdered a man. It, 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 by all accounts, he was a rather unsavoury character. <laughs> and, you know, the world's probably a better place without him. Um, and and in, a, in a way, thank you for, uh, <laughs> for, for bringing him to the final court of justice. Um, so, w once more, uh, Uncle Dennis, uh, thank you for, for stabbing him to death. And, <laughs> and thank you, Shirley D, for being my guest. Shirley D! We're going to change the tone a bit now. <clears throat> it's cold. It's damp. It's dark. I want to go home. I want to be in a warm bed, but I can't because I'm chained to a radiator in a cell. Of course, I'm not. <laughs> My next guest was because he was a hostage for two years in Liberia in the Civil War. Don't expect him to be too perky. He was only released six months ago. And he's still suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Please welcome Chris Lester. <laughs> knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Chris Lester. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. Right, thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you for being my hostage today. Uh, I assure you, I, I won't be keeping you for longer than ten minutes. Right. <laughs> now, you were confined, you were confined for two years. Two years, that's right. Yeah. Now, how long is that, exactly? <laughs> uh, well, it... Yeah, it's a, it's a long time when you right. when you don't know when it's going to end. and right. I mean, it's a long time out of anyone's it's, life. Yeah, I mean, but let's sort of break it down. It's 100 weeks. It's... Yeah. It's, it's 18,000 18, hours. hours yeah. 18,000 episodes of The Darling Buds of May, if you like. Um, yeah. or, or, in another way, 36,000 episodes of Knowing Me, Knowing You. <laughs> it sounds like torture. <laughs> Was it? Was um, it torture? Yeah, well, obviously, psychologically. Um, well, I mean, good. we weren't... We were just, we were just um, political pawns, you see. Pawns just... in, a, in a game of cruel chess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who were the bishops? <laughs> yeah, I don't think the metaphor stretches, really. <laughs> Fine, OK, all right. Now, how... how a question I'm sure everyone wants to know is, how did you relieve the boredom? Yeah. Um, well, well, you ha you have to keep yourself um, mentally active all the time, and because you can't be active physically, so so you invent games. You play games. Um, for example, uh, shopping. Which I don't know if you know the shopping game where you say, um, "No." I I went shopping and I bought an apple, and then I went shopping and I bought an apple and a banana. Say A B. I went shopping and I bought an apple and banana, and something beginning with C, a cucumber or a, a carrot. So Cake. Cake or coat. yeah. coat, coats, yeah, it can be, it can be anything coats. beginning or, with C. Uh, see, and you have to or cheese. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to cuss out, but it counts. So cheese is fine. Cheese is an apple, banana, cheese, cheese. cheese. So, um, so D, D, D. Are we going up to Z on this? Are we? <laughs> no, no, no. It's not, not a good idea to go to, to Z. Zebra. <laughs> Whilst you were there, what I want to know is there must have been some funny incidents. <laughs> there must have been... Something funny must have happened. Well, no, no, not really. I mean, you've got to imagine the situation that you, you're in the cell basically for 24 hours a day. I know. There's well, no I, exercise. I, I know it was depressing. I just don't want to dwell on that. If, I don't, really don't want to... It, mm. It's... I, I, you know, I really look, can't just... I'm not asking sort of... that. Look, I'm just saying, will you do something amusing? You tell us an amusing story. <laughs> Come on! Um, well, after about six months um, in prison, I found, um, scuttering across the floor, a, a little beetle, and I, I called it Hope. 
Um, and after, after about six months, um, I fell asleep and, and the matchbox was open and, and hope escaped. But in a way, I wasn't sad because hope had escaped and I felt that prefigured in a way my own escape, which indeed it did because I escaped 12 months later. Um, and you, you're, you're absolutely sure that's the funniest thing. <laughs> It, you, listen, if you can remember anything, well, just, just please, this is very important, if you can remember anything funny okay. in the rest of the interview, just cut straight in with right. it. Right, fine. <laughs> you know, and if you want, um, you can make something up. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll tell you, in fact, if you want to get one of the researchers, get Frank Muir's book of anecdotes, yeah. just oh. dress it up, change the location, right. it doesn't matter. Mm, and, uh, okay. Yeah. I just want you to get the audience yeah. on your side, because uh, I have to say, at the moment, you're coming across as a bit of a sourpuss. <laughs> I don't want the punters to think you're a bad egg. I know you're not. I don't think you're quite understanding the situation. Like, you have to make do with what you have in those, in those sort of situations. Like, you don't have much of a choice, for example. Well, I mean, you did have a choice. This is what you've not told the audience, that for two years you were chained to another human being. Phil. Phil. You had a choice between talking to a human being on one hand and a dung beetle on the other. Yeah, it was not a you, dung beetle, an elm beetle. Whatever but, it is, uh, they're all stupid. I mean... <clears throat> now, uh, I think it's about time we had a surprise. A surprise for you. Yes, he was chained to you for two years. <laughs> You've not seen him for six months. He impressed us all with his good humour and positive attitude when he was released. Please applaud loudly and freely for Chris's comrade in chains, Phil Collins. No, no, no knowing me, knowing you. Aha. Aha. Now, before we go any further, get it cleared up straight away. You're not the real Phil Collins. <laughs> just, uh... That's right. No, no, I'm not the bald guy in Genesis. No, it's just. Just got the same name. That's right. Now, you were incarcerated for two years. Um, just to recap on the maths of that, it's, it's as I say, uh, 36,000 episodes of Know Me, Know You, 18,000 episodes of Darling Buds of May, and uh, actually, Another way of looking at it, it's, it's 9,000 episodes of Inspector Morse. <laughs> it's not, not so bad when you look at it like that, is it? <laughs> yeah, I wish we'd had a video. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the, 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 the first time I decided to have you on the show... No, I don't like the sound of that, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> great, it's great, you've got a great... I like that. <laughs> Funny. Now... You, you, now, the first time I decided was at the press conference when you were released. Yeah. Because um, it was a very momentous occasion. It was televised all around the world. Chris, you came on and gave a very harrowing account of, of your experience. And then you came on, Phil, and you were hilarious. <laughs> you really were. I have a very positive view of everything. Right. I always try to keep positive, like yourself, Al. Absolutely. So, on the day when it was time for me to speak, I stood at the desk... And uh, I picked up this big ball and chain, plonked it on top of the desk, and I said, Phew, glad to see the last of that. <laughs> and then I ripped off the chain from the ball because it was made of polystyrene. And uh, that, everyone fell about. That, that, they were big laughs yeah. when you did that. Big and, then, laughs. <laughs> and if you remember, I stood on the desk mm. and uh, I sort of shook all this sand out of my pockets mm. like I'd just escaped from cold it, you know, yeah. like in the film. Yeah, that didn't go down so well. <laughs> But the great thing about you is you've got your book out. That's right. I've read it. It's brilliant. It's dynamite. <laughs> it really is. It's called Hostage. Um, Exclamation mark. That's right, Don't yeah. forget that. And then it's got my name, Phil Collins, in big gold embossed letters. Yeah. Then really in brackets nice. underneath it, not in Genesis. The not the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, um, just so people, people know. It's clear. Right, OK. Now, um, re let, read an extract out. Yeah, Come I've got on. A, uh, an extract here let's prepared. Let's hear that. Um, really cooking. Just, just so people understand what the plot is, basically, right. it's, it's, as I said, it's based on me and uh, uh, Chris <laughs> in the cell, uh, oh. but I've kind of changed it a bit. It was morning, early, six. Paul Carter snapped awake instinctively, alert, ready. Les Christopher lay on his side, his thumb in his mouth, sucking like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> 
Carter rose from his bunk. His feet felt the hard, cold, stone-grey floor, feet that had trod every trouble spot in the world, feet that had tasted a touch of danger, feet that had seen too much. Brilliant. A black beetle scuttled across the floor. Instinctively, Carter crushed it with his heel. It uh, shattered with a satisfying you, crunch. Uh, excuse me, Phil. Carter one smiled. One, one, was that my beetle? It's fiction. Did that happen? Did you crush my beetle? Is that what happened to my beetle? Oh, 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 no, oh, 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 oh. Chris, it was six months ago. It's an on. accident. You, it was an ac another I didn't accident. crush it on purpose. Hang I on. woke up one morning. Your I beetle cannot, was but another thing you've done. Look, I mean, if you weren't I'm so not, busy but, walking listen, around, please, because your book's look, not selling, Chris. Oh, 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 hang on. oh, oh hey, hey, look, listen, stop, everyone. Are you, well, are you staring at me? No. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the thing is, I want to point out that hope was crushed, but it was hope, the cockroach, not hope, the, the ideal, hope, 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 the, hope, the, hope, the, 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 what are they laughing at? Uh, no. Alan, um, are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. It's, uh, um, it's, it's, well, you didn't crush a beetle. Be you didn't crush John Lennon. He's a beetle. Didn't crush him. He's, <laughs> that would have been bad. He's already dead. Paul McCartney's still alive. He's doing sure it with Linda okay? McCartney. She's doing the vegetarian you sure you're all right? dishes, microwave dishes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Vitamin um, deficiency, um, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really hungry, actually. I'm really hungry. I'm, I'm, what, have you got any cornflakes? Are you okay? no. Sugar. I'm, I'm just, I like, just like frozen food. I like going home and uh, get the frozen food and cook it like, up, and it's really nice. And just look, put it in a bowl and eat it. Right, now put the video on. I've got a TV. It's the biggest TV you can get. Alan, it's like you six feet something? across. TV, and it's like a big eye in the room. It sort of stares at me, and it scares me, and I don't like it. Alan. I don't like it, and I'm Alan. not going home tonight. Alan. What? I, what? I, I, think what? I think you've taken some drugs. I've taken drugs? Yes. I, I, I have taken, on that bombshell, <laughs> I, Alan Partridge, have taken drugs. Chris Lester. Chris Lester. Bill Collins. Bill Collins, the famous one, uh, Shirley Big Tits, uh, The Frog, uh, the writers and researchers, Steve Pilgrim, Patrick Marvel, Rebecca Front, David Snyder, Drew McKeegan, produced by Amanda Iannucci. Say, say uh, it, let's uh, Right. Yeah. 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 Welcome to Knowing Me, Knowing You, my chat show with me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, the you, my guests, and the, uh, the you, the audience. Before the chat show, I've got a bit of a plug I want to do with a new book I've just published. It's by Petri Publications, the uh, <laughs> publishing wing of my company, and it's a collection of amusing sporting anecdotes. It's, it's called The Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Stadium to Alan Partridge. <laughs> by Alan Partridge. Um, it's a stocking filly, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not going to win the Booker Prize. You know, it'd be nice to be nominated. Um, but, uh, before I introduce my first guest, here's an extract from the book, and it's about when I bumped my car into a well-known celebrity's car. George Best's. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have told you that, actually. I'm supposed, it's a bit of a surprise in the anecdote. Anyway, um, I'll read it. I just finished having lunch with Jeff Capes, the shop putter at the Savoy, and I was reversing my Ford Granada out of a parking space when, bang, I'd bumped into a very flashy Lotus sports car. Who's driving that, I wondered. You'll never guess. It was none other than George Best. Sorry about that, George, I said. Oh, well, he said, I suppose we'll have to swap insurance details. <laughs> and I said, yes. God. George Best. <laughs> Marvellous. Um, OK. <laughs> my, uh, my first... My first... No. My first guest tonight is not George Best. He's, uh, he's a bit of a handful. I'm, uh, no, I'm honoured to say my first guest is a member of the royal family. Yes, all day here at Pear Tree Productions, 
We've been rolling out the red carpets and the walls have been licked with a new coat of paint. She's regal, she's royal. Please give a loyal round of applause to a very nice person, the Duchess of Stranra. <laughs> Stranra. The first question, Duchess, I have to ask is, how do I address you? Well, um, uh, really, there are three forms of address. Formally, you would call me um, Your Grace. Um, as Sorry, I'm rather nervous. That's all um, right. As this is informal, um, you would address me as Duchess or Duchess. Um, just Emma, which is, of course, what my right. family or, or you... my husband would call me. <laughs> Your husband's hardly likely to call you Duchess, is he? <laughs> Is the tea ready, Duchess? No, I'm going to do that, is she? No. But uh, you are, you're a very different kind of royal because you're not like Princess Di. She's kind of, she's very beautiful. <laughs> but you're more of an outdoor type. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, and it's nice with your hair all piled up on top of your head like that. And it's nice in the royal way. Now, <laughs> what a lot of us would like to know, I'm sure, is as a royal, what do you do? What do you do? Well, um, a lot of the time I work for charity. Um, the rest of the time, really, I work on the estate. Um, it's a large estate, as I'm sure you can imagine, mm. and there is a lot of work involved, and, um, and it's a pleasure for me to, to uh, spend yeah, I, my time doing that. I, I've seen a photograph of it, and I, and I, would, I would dearly like to come and visit the place. Well, <laughs> well, you must, really, because... Um, the house and gardens are open to the public. Um, <laughs> three days a week. Right. Um, that's Mondays, Wednesdays right, and so, Fridays. So if, if oh, I came, I'd be with, like, the public? Well, I hope so, yes. Right. I mean, we try to encourage all comers. We, we like to have a crowd. Right. But, I mean, I was, see, during the week's a bit difficult for me. I was thinking if I could maybe come at the weekend. <laughs> we don't open at weekends. We, we yeah. have to have the house to ourselves. Yeah, I've, I'm getting wires crossed it. I think what I'm trying to say is... I, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I would really like to come and stay for, you know, as a guest for a weekend. Oh, I see. I suspect you're teasing me a little bit. Well, no, um... I mean... I, I, no, I, would, I, you know, I mean, you are always welcome to Caxton Avenue in Norwich. <laughs> Just, you know, ring your head and... We're, 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 I'm delighted. So, I mean, c could I stay? Um... It would... Be a little difficult to arrange. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Fair enough. We'll, we'll talk about it after this. Yes. Show. Yes. <laughs> Get our diaries out. Hammer out a few dates. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Now, what are your plans for the next year? Well, um, in July next year, we are planning a grand charity gala for Refuse, the anti-drugs charity, um, and that will be at the Royal Albert Hall. Wonderful. And and, uh, and after that. After that, I think I'll be putting my feet up at home. <laughs> I'll need a rest. Yes. So what about then? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what about then? Well, can I come and stay then? <laughs> well, um, I, I think we could discuss that nearer the time. Yeah, well, it's just that, you know... We're both busy people, you know. If we discuss it nearer the time, it's not going to happen, is it? I mean, that's what I say when I want to put someone off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. It's good, you know, it's good to meet a royal like you. He's got a sense of humour. Well, I have to say that, as a family, we have a sense of humour. I mean, when we all get together, we have a blooming good laugh, yeah. you know. <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. And a dance? Absolutely, we love dancing, yes. Yeah, yes. A, bit of, a bit of a sing-song. Oh, we have many musical yeah. evenings together, yes. Uh, now and again, a bit of, a bit of tomfoolery. Mm, <laughs> yes, one or two practical <laughs> jokes get played. And I'll bet that now and again, when you're on your own, you secretly get completely rat assed <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, the point really about all this fame is that I am prepared to try to use what little fame I have for I'm sorry. charity. Sorry. <laughs> I do a lot of work, as I've said, for Refuse. It's a drugs rehabilitation charity. I think I overstepped the mark there before. <laughs> so I'm really am genuinely sorry about that. Well went too far. Yes you did. Right. So um most of my work really um, You forgive me. 
involves um, this kind of public relations exercise. Look, look, let's talk about your charity. (laughs) Yes, I am. Right, uh, because you were touched personally, weren't you, by... By the drugs problem. Yes, yes indeed. That's, that's really what began me on, on this crusade. Um, my son, Clive, yes. had a drugs problem. That's right, Clive the junkie, as you were <laughs> <laughs> Well, he, he's not a, no, he's not a drug sorry, addict. No, he yeah. had a drug <laughs> problem. <laughs> Thanks to Refuse, um, he no longer has one. And right. That was in the press. I don't know if, if, if any of the audience are unfamiliar with that uh, instance, just to sort of put... I don't want to dwell on it, but... Uh, <laughs> That was when uh, your son Clive was in the Café Royal. He yes. smashed it up, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> it, wasn't nice. it was very yeah. unfortunate. Yeah. It was a long time ago, and the point really is... He trashed the place, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's all in the past yes. because he has been able to help himself right. and get back into the community. Wonderful. Now, you have two lovely daughters. Yes. Alicia. She's a bit of a maverick, isn't she? Oh, no. Um, she's now a performance artist and doing an actress. Very well. An actress. No, 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 no. Um, a performance artist. You, well, you watch them paint. You watch... Well, <laughs> no, it, it's rather more complicated than that. She, if I can just give you an example um, of a performance that she gave some time ago in um, a space which I attended, she had daubed herself in paint of many colours and accompanied by um, a pop record, um, I think if I remember rightly it was Gary Glitter Um, (laughs) I think it was Do You Want To Be In My Gang, I I can't remember Um, she marched very purposefully backwards and forwards throughout the space, back and forth back and forth, back and forth and it was really very powerful It sounds hilarious, it really does (laughs) Um, Well <laughs> it was witty, yeah. um, but it was <laughs> sounds like the goons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. Very but, uh, I don't want to press you on this, but I have one of the reviews Xerox here, and it says she was seen simulating defecation on a photograph of Winston Churchill. What's all that about? <laughs> um, I wasn't present at that performance. Mm. I think it was an encore or something. I'm... I don't know. Um, I mean, you, you'd have to ask Alicia. Well, get her on the show. Yes. As long as she doesn't defecate on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she'd only simulate it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm at the top of my profession. Yeah, there's been a little argument about that, but you, <laughs> you, in a sense, are not at the top of yours. You're 27th in line to the throne, so that's quite a way to go. Oh. There isn't really a career structure, you know. I mean, I I have a position which I have always held. Do you want to be queen? (laughs) No. No, I don't. Deep down? No. No, not at all. Could happen. No, it couldn't happen. Could happen. Let me me paint a hypothesis for you. It's Christmas. Balmoral. The whole royal family are there. Edward pulls a cracker. There's a bomb in it. They're all oh, wiped out. <laughs> no, really? No, they're, they're wiped out. Just bear with this, right? The outer royals, the, the Armstrong Joneses and that photographer bloke, they're, they, all, they are all going to the funeral in a big minibus. <laughs> a sniper takes out the driver. No, It really, goes over must... a cliff. No, I'm sorry. Stay I with it. To... Stay with it. Just bear with me. Now, your husband is shooting grouse. A messenger brings him the news of this tragic second event. In his excitement, he realises he's going to be king. (laughs) Suddenly he loses his footing and, with his shotgun, and this may be stressful, he blows his own head clean off. No, this is going too far. Now, the Prime Minister knocks on your door and says, Emma, will you be queen? What do you say? (laughs) No, it's a a preposterous question. It it could... I would... You know, if I was asked by the Prime Minister, would you be king? I'd say, I would sacrifice my career on Radio 4 and I would say, I would say, yes, I will be King Alan. (laughs) Um, uh, the first. (laughs) Would you, are you prepared, would you do your duty to your country? This is pure fiction. In those, would you do, do you think she should be queen? Do you think she should be queen? Yes. 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 
would you be queen? No, those circumstances would not arise. It's, In your people's hour of need, <laughs> I mean, would you be queen? Of course, in those circumstances, yes. Of yes, you do want to be queen. Yes. <laughs> of course you do. You're only human. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. And uh, if you make it to the top job, come back on the show. Tell us about it. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Ladies and gentlemen, the Duchess of Stranra. OK. Now, next guest on the show, we've got uh, Dustin Hoffman, Sean Connery, Michael Caine and Frank Spencer. In fact, we haven't really got those people on. But, in a sense, we have, because my next guest is a very talented young impressionist. And he can do all their voices. <laughs> so it seemed like they were on. <laughs> My researchers spotted him in a little club, the comedy shop, and they said, Alan, he's a bit near the knuckle. And I said, I don't mind that, as long as his knuckle is near his funny bone. And I'm, I'm, sure, it, I'm sure it will be. I'm prepared to take a chance on him, and I hope you are too, as I welcome funny voice man impressionist Steve Thompson. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable. Welcome to Knowing Me, Knowing You. Aha. 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 This is your first chat show. Yeah, you've that's right. You've not, that's right. Done, uh, you've not done Wogan yet. Eh, no, I haven't yet reached the giddy heights of Wogan. <laughs> do, do you Wogan for us? <laughs> eh. Terry Morgan. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll work some impressions uh, subtly into the show. But um, first, let's talk about this new alternative comedy thing. What is that? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not really a new thing, you know. It's actually uh, been around for about ten years right. now, you know. A lot of people think, oh, it's, it's new, but it's not. Ben Elton. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, indeed. A no, little bit no, of no, politics. No, I, I yes. don't, mean, don't mean do him. I mean, he's an alternative comedy. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, people say, yeah, Ben Elton is, is alternative, but, I mean, you know, this distinction yeah. I want to make is between good and bad yeah. comedy, you know, it's not about alternative. Right, but you or... hate all the old comedians, don't you? <laughs> no, that's, that's another myth about, you know, uh, us sort of newer generation people. No, right. I've got l uh, the deepest respect for, you know, people like Tony Hancock, Morecambe and Wise, uh, you Frankie know... Frankie Howard. Frankie Howard, the Goons, actually, the Goons, brilliant. Monty Python. Monty Python, brilliant. Bernard Manning, Jim not, Davidson, no, Les not, Dennis. Not, not so much them people, more, more the other people, not, not right. them so much. Right, right. you hate them. <laughs> no, 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 you're playing devil's advocate here, Alan. I just want you to admit that you hate Les Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean... <laughs> What, what the distinction I want to make is between sort of, you know, that they're sort of joke-based comedy. Right. And the stuff I do is more kind of truthful, observational stuff. Right, you, know? you, you tell observations, don't you? I make observations. Right. <laughs> do an observation. <laughs> um, uh, well, this, this is a bad example, but um, have, you, have you noticed how um, when you get in a cab and you're talking to the taxi driver, he always turns around to talk to you, so maybe, maybe you should have a, he should have a steering wheel on his shoulder. Is that... Well, which bit of that's the observation? <laughs> the first bit. First bit. Right. You're right, that's a bad example. Um, <laughs> let, let's... In, in, in my comedy, I'm trying to, um, trying to uh, deal with uh, generic human truths, you know. Hmm. I, w I, w I, want, I want to be funny, yeah. but... With dignity. Do you, Frank Spencer? <laughs> oh, Betsy, oh, mm, yeah. the cat's done a woodsie. Oh, very good. Mm. Oh, uh, uh, do Dustin Hoffman. Oh, oh Michael Dorsey and Dorothy Michael. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 great, well, love well, What would Sean Connery say if he came in the door now? <laughs> I think he'd say, uh, my name is Bond, James Bond. Your name is Partridge, <laughs> Alan Partridge. Of course he probably, would. Probably Roy somewhere. Hattersley. Can't do him. All right, OK. Um, uh, oh, oh, look, Frank Spencer's come back in the door. Uh, I, I really don't actually do Frank Spencer. I just... I did it then, cos... Right. Cos I, I, I needed to, but I, I don't actually... Do... You, uh, you're one of the spitting images, aren't you? Uh, well, I, I do voices on spitting images. Right. I've been tipped off by my spitting images insider 
that uh, deep down somewhere they're planning to do a new puppet. Oh, yeah, they're of... doing uh, Alan Henson, because yes. he does Match of the yeah. Day. And, and, yeah, yeah. and I've heard they're doing a, a puppet of one Alan Partridge. <laughs> Oh, I can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah, that, come uh, on, tell rumor. us the truth. Let, are they, are they, oh, I'm sworn to secrecy, oh, Alan. Man, no, come on, are say. they making a puppet of me? No. <laughs> right, that's, that's a relief. <laughs> there is. Phew, close shave there. <laughs> to make, make fun of me. Um, but you do do an impression of me, don't you? <laughs> uh, I, I, once I did one, yeah, a gig, yeah. I did an impression. Well, of can we hear it now? Well, I, I don't know if it's appropriate for this programme. You know, it's Come quite, on. you know, I do it quite late night in a, it doesn't quite matter, a busy club. I, you can't scare me. You're talking to a man who's been debagged at a pharmaceutical conference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Come on, do, do uh, your Alan Parker. No, I just, I, do, I prefer look, not to. I just that's why you're on the show. Do Alan Parker. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Alan Partridge. Welcome to Knowing Me. Knowing you with Alan Partridge. Alan Partridge. I'll just say my name again. I'm Alan Partridge. It's not that I like the sound of my own voice, it's just I enjoy hearing myself speak. I'm Alan Partridge. This is Sports Desk. I'm Alan Partridge. People say I make mistakes, but the only mistake I've ever made was being born. I'm Alan Partridge. I'm the non-thinking man's Elton Wellsby. I'm Alan Partridge. I'm a media whore with no punters. Let me on the telly. Let me on the telly. I'm Alan Say that. Partridge. I'm Don't... a man. I'm Alan Partridge. I'll tell you, I'm Alan Partridge. I'm the man who makes Jimmy Hill look like Umberto Eco. I'm Alan Partridge. Alan Partridge. Alan Partridge. Alan Partridge. Alan Partridge. Now that, sunshine, is libelous. <laughs> Now that, sunshine, is libelous. That's what I said. That's what I said. What are you doing? What are you doing? Will you just stop repeating? Stop. Don't, what are you no, trying to but, do? Oh, stop it! Stop it! You, this is stupid! This is stupid! You're, you're making yourself look stupid! You're making yourself look no, stupid! Stop that now! Stop that stop now! It. Stop it! Uh, don't no, say no, anymore! No, don't don't say anymore! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it. You look ridiculous! You look ridiculous! That's it! That's it! That's it! That was... Steve Thompson there, the impressionist. That was it's Steve Thompson. You're not there. still doing it. You're still doing it's it. It's ridiculous now. It's ridiculous now. Not, it's ridiculous. 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 Please, Please stop, stop it. Stop it. I'm Alan Partridge. I'm Alan Partridge. And what's Umberto Echo? What's Umberto Echo? <laughs> Translate that now. Translate that now. What is it? What is what, it? What is 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 it? He's a person. He's a person? <laughs> He's a person? What does he do? He's a semiologist. He's a semiologist. He's a semiologist. What's the semiologist? What's the semiolo what, is what, is what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? I'm not telling you. <laughs> What's the semiologist? What's the semiologist? No, you can't do you that. You can't do that. Stop it. Stop it. I'm Alan Partridge. I'm Alan Partridge. I'm Alan Partridge. I'm Alan Partridge. <laughs> if you speak again, I will physically hit you. <laughs> That was, um, that was Steve Thompson there, the, the impressionist. A quick question before you go, Steve. What's the name of the researcher that booked you? I don't know. Is it Lisa? No. Must have been Jason, then. That's all I need to know. <laughs> OK, um, Steve Thompson there. Thanks very much, Steve. There's no time to clap. There's no time to clap. There's no... no there's no time. There's no time. Now... My next guest is a government minister. She made a name in the early 80s as the uncompromising leader of Norwich City Council. <laughs> and as an MP, she's quickly shot up the greasy pole as junior minister for housing. In the past week, she's been subject to some unforgivable press rumour and innuendo regarding her holiday abroad with two 17-year-old boy twins. <laughs> and she's come onto my show tonight to clear her name and to tell us how she's making this country great again. Please welcome the Junior Minister for Housing, the delightful Mrs. Sandra Peaks. <laughs> welcome. Knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, the Minister for Housing, Mrs. Sandra Peaks, aha. Uh -huh. It's my pleasure, Alan. No, you say aha. Uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Thanks. 
Now, you, you and I have something in common, don't we? We both live in Norwich, That's yes. right. We both come from the little island in the bog, Norwich, and uh, you're now MP for Norwich, and you've reached, recently reached the dizzy heights of uh, junior ministerial office. Congratulations. Thank you very much, and thank you for your sterling work in the election with the Loud yeah. Taylor. Well, I, 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 it was a pleasure. I don't, I don't want to disclose my political affiliations here. I think that would be inappropriate, but suffice to say that on April the 10th, I think we all breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> oh. We certainly did. And, uh, of course, if I may say so, a very successful leader of Norwich Council. That's in, right, in doing time. what uh, had to be done, getting rates down, getting poll tax down, and um, not handing out money, but handing out hope, which is a lot more precious. Right, and getting rid, of those, uh, getting rid of those gypsies as well. <laughs> um, but we're here to talk about the rumours, the sordid speculation that's blighted your life over the past couple of days. It's been um, rammed down everybody's throat. Yes. Now, for listeners, for listeners at home, those who've uh, had the good fortune not to have seen the photographs in the tabloids, they depict the minister quite simply on holiday, on a lounger, with two young lads just, you know, popping a bit of baby lotion onto your tummy and legs. Now, these 17-year-old twin brothers... Hence the uh, predictably smutty sun headline. Twin Peaks, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Presumably a reference to your, uh, to your ample bosom there. No, that's a reference to the fact that my name is Sandra Peaks and the two lads were twins. Oh, right, that's right. Kind of... <laughs> but it works both ways, doesn't it? Really? Well, if you have a tawdry mind, yes. yes. What, 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 was, what, was that, what was actually going on? Well, look, as you well know, Alan, the only Twin Peaks that I'm interested in are the Twin Peaks of initiative and responsibility. Very clever. Now, these two lads, these were two homeless people with initiative, and they wrote to me explaining the situation, which quite naturally I wanted to do something mm -hmm. about, yeah. and we gave them a, a job on Brightside Constructions, my husband Brian's That's construction That's right, industry. because he's employed a lot of young boys, hasn't he? Yes, yes, 250 in the last three months. Golly, that's, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> um, but why, why did you take the boys on holiday? Well, this is the point I'm trying to make. It's very easy to lose touch with the public, and Brian and I thought it'd be a great idea to take Craig and Matt away, get them out of their depressing environment, get to know them at a grassroots level. Now, if a minister for housing can't get to know the very people she's trying to house, then what sort of democracy is it? Absolute hear, hear, as they say in the House of Lords. Now, uh, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, that issue is closed. We've got rid of the muck. We've hosed you down. But uh, just in case there's uh, any little bit of dirt still sticking in any nooks or crannies or, or cracks on you, then let's get out the high-pressure nozzle. Let's, <laughs> let's do that by bringing on to this programme, with your consent... The, Absolutely, yes. ..the two young lads at the centre of this episode. They're here tonight. Please welcome the two 17-year-old twin lads. They've been great in hospitality, making us all laugh. Please welcome Craig and Matt Bradley. <laughs> Craig and Matt, welcome. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, now, which, which, which one's Craig, which one's Matt? I'm Craig. Oh, Matt. Right, OK. Do you enjoy hospitality? Yes, yes. Yeah? Great, yeah. Manage to eat the sandwiches? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take a few cans home with you? Yeah, yeah right. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really, I don't, I don't, I don't do that stuff. I don't pilfer. Um, <laughs> now, you've heard and read presumably, about the allegations. Tell us about the minister. You know her better than anyone else. What's she like? She's oh, very nice. Yeah, she, she's lovely. Yeah. We're just like one big happy family, aren't we? Yeah. Right. And so what was your reaction when you saw the photographs in the paper? Oh, I, I, well, I, I, yeah, I, I thought it was disgusting. I mean, you know, in this day and age, just because someone goes topless, you know, there's well, a big well, scandal. She wasn't it? topless in the photo. No, I never right. took my top off. No, what Matt, what Matt means is that we were topless. Me and Matt were topless. Yeah. So um, Mrs Peaks was never topless. Right. Yeah. We're just one big happy family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, you had a great time. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I Lovely. wish I was 17 again. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Just so that I could... We were one big happy family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you said that. OK, I've heard what you said, and I have to say that I, Alan Partridge, <laughs> think that someone here smells deeply of fish. 
And it's not Alan Partridge. <laughs> now, what are you trying to say, Alan? It's all a bit too squeaky clean. Come on, lads. Bottom line, I've got a checkbook here. <laughs> How much to spill the beans? No, 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 no Alan, do not descend into 20, the... 20,000. 20,000, I got more... Don't accept it. shut it, Sandra. Deuce is telling me you can have £16,000. It's not enough. Do not believe that I am sitting here, and you, Three. Alan Parker... It's not enough. enough. Don't worry, I'll get it. I'll give you four out of my own pocket. Cash. Yeah, right, right yeah. After Cash. the show. After the show, we'll do that. Right. 16 now. Yeah. Right, I'm done. Okay. Okay. done, done. I'm leaving, Mr Partridge. She's getting up, the minister's leaving the show. She's walking out on my show. She's going, she's off the show. Thank you, that's all, Minister. Now, dish the dirt. Where's the chip? The chip. Right, um, there. Uh, Make what it out to think? me, Craig Bradley. Craig. And Matt. No, no, that's all right, I'll sort it out. Right. <laughs> there. Now, come on, quick, we've got two minutes. Dirt. Quickly. Right. Come on. We're rent boys. Re rent boys, right. What did you do? What did you Everything. do? Everything. Yeah. You got, so got us through an agency. Yeah. What, yeah. Is, what, did, what did you do? Uh, bondage. Uh, she made us dress like dogs. That's, That's disgusting. You're like dogs. Totally but on these dogs. She had sort of metal clanking leads. Yeah. Oh, All like, leather, like dogs. That's awful. Anyone, yeah. anyone, anyone. She made quick. us bark and we had to eat dog food from a silver yeah. bowl. That's with disgusting. Her I ate it. I ate it. Did Craig she didn't. use a Tors? A what? It's a uh, bamboo back leather strap, three prongs. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. They're yeah. right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they were right. And she made, she made, quickly, uh, quickly. Brian wanted to be a dog oh, as well, but she right. wouldn't let him. Yes, and she did. made Mr. Peaks go into the bathroom and lick milk up from the shower. Yeah. Did he go meow yeah. like a cat? No. No, no, no. no. Right, okay. He was quickly, please. G give me some physical evidence of what she did. Right, all right. Quick. Yeah. Look at my bottom. Look at that. <laughs> look at his bottom, ladies and gentlemen. There are, look at that. But it's look at his. Alan, they can't see. I'll describe it. It's, it's got two cheeks. It's just like an ordinary one, but, but uh, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's got deep welt marks my brother, inflicted he can't by a tours, inflicted by a minister of the crown. And on that bombshell, we say, knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, the you, the impressionist, the you, the Duchess of Stranra, the you, the rent boys, and the you, the minister of the crown. That's all from me, Alan Partridge. Thanks to my team of writers and researchers, Steve Coogan, Patrick Marber, David Schneider, Rebecca Bronx, Doom McKeegan. <laughs> Thanks also to my producer, Armando Iannucci. We'll be back at the same time next week. And we, we just heard, we just heard that Sandra Peaks, the Minister for Housing, has just resigned. Yes, a broken woman. We broke her. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>because I, Alan Partridge, am broadcasting live from Las Vegas, US of A, stateside. I promise you tonight we have a real half-pound cheeseburger of, uh, of a show for you. <laughs> and it's a cheeseburger that contains lots of meaty chat, a salad of wit, and a, a flap of amusing cheese. <laughs> All held together by my sauce of tomato ketchup, or... For you here in the States, tomato cats up. That's what you say. <laughs> now, for those of you listening beneath the Star Spangled Banner who haven't heard of me, I'm a sort of an English Johnny Carson. And uh, <laughs> for those of you listening beneath the Union Jack, I'm Alan Partridge. <laughs> now, tonight, for various reasons, my producer and American co-producers here in Vegas thought it would be a good idea if I had an American co-host. And that's great. It's a good idea. I agree with it. So, to that end, please welcome my co-host, or should I say, hostess. Perhaps I shouldn't say hostess, because that, in England, is a whore. And she's, <laughs> she's not a whore. She's not a whore. Nevertheless, she's the sort of woman that you wouldn't mind paying cash to be with. <laughs> because she's so beautiful and lovely. Please welcome supermodel Kendall Ball. <laughs> Right, 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 okay, right, shh, shh. 
Knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Kendall Ball. Uh huh. Uh huh. Hi, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> in Vegas, OK? Right, right, fantastic. Uh, Kendall, it's swell, or uh, in English, uh, great to have you on. Great to have you on my show. Well, it's great to be on the show, Alan. My show. Now, now, in case anyone listening doesn't know who you are or what you look like, I'll describe you to the listeners. Now, she's very beautiful. No, she's very please, tall. Alan. My fa- I, I have these sticky-out ears that look like Prince Charles. I oh, hate them. Oh, come on. You don't look like Prince Charles. Well, I hate them. His Royal Highness is a, someone who I, I share many of his beliefs, and I, and I agree with a lot of what he says, but he's a deeply ugly man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've lovely, you've got a lovely little beauty spot there. Oh, this is a mole, Alan. It's awful. Yeah, I don't like using the word mole. It's not a mole. It is. I'm going to have it removed. It, no, come It's not a big, fat mole with a tuft of wiry hair growing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to describe you, basically, um, what, what you're wearing, you look like a million dollars, your legs go right up to your armpits. Uh, not literally, that would be hideous. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, remember. <laughs> remember, please, to listen to me and look at her. <laughs> Don't get it the other way round, please. That would be, that would be awful. <laughs> OK. Our first guests are a married couple. In fact, they're one of Hollywood's star couples. She is the daughter of legendary star Mamie Langland and sister of the equally legendary star Laura Langland. And, of course, is a superlative singing star in her own right. And he is a British actor, gentleman star, who first twinkled his bright talent in the Hollywood galaxy 40 years ago when he starred in the film Little Lord Fauntleroy. So please give a glittering reception to Sally Hoff... I say that. Sally Hoff and Conrad Knight! Knowing me, Alan Partridge. Knowing me, Kendall Ball. Knowing us, Alan Partridge and Kendall Ball. <laughs> knowing you, Sally Hoff, and husband Conrad Knight. Aha. 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 Now, if I, Sally Hoff, and husband Sally. Hi. Lovely Sally. Hello, Alan. Hello, Kendall. Oh, it's lovely to meet you, Sally. Thank you I've so admired much. your work for many years. Oh, Kendall, that is such a lovely right, thing to lovely. say. Right, lovely. 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 lovely to see yes. you. Isn't Sally lovely. terrific? Yes, she's lovely. Yes. <laughs> Sally, you are daughter of the legendary Mamie Langland, That's right. uh, sister of the legendary Lara Langland. Uh huh. Now she is so busy, isn't she? She's. She's wonderfully busy. She's I'm very proud of Laura. Hectic schedule. She's certainly... I know for a fact she's working tonight. Um, <laughs> as, as is Carly Simon, Liza Minnelli, Barbara Streisand, all working tonight. Um, but you are available. That's the important thing. You're, you're here. Yeah. Well, now, what was it like growing up in a famous family? It must have been marvellous. Alan... It was magical. I had a fairy tale childhood. With your mother, Mamie Langland. I love those films she oh, I'm made. I'm so happy. Good. Sally, tell us about your mother's alcoholism. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> I don't want to sully the memory of her mother was a fine, wonderful musical actress. I don't want to think about her mother as some drunken woman wandering around Sunset Boulevard in her bare feet with a mascara running down her face, <laughs> directing traffic, holding a bottle of gin in her hand. I want to think of her sitting on a haystack and singing Hopscotch Girl in a pink dress. Well, yes, it was a very private problem. I've written a book about it, that's all there is to say. <laughs> Conrad, you published your autobiography, um, Agent in L.A. A gent in L.A. <laughs> published, in, published in 1979 which had very bad reviews. There was a particularly bad one in Spy magazine. It simply changed one of the words of the title of your book. The, the, they changed the first two letters of the word gent. Yes. And left the last two. Yes. Um, so it was a something in L.A. Yes. Right. And I, I immediately sued Spy magazine. Mm. Sadly, he lost the case. Mm. In fact, you set a legal precedent because you're one of the uh, few people who can now be referred to in print as that thing. Yes. Without fear of litigation. That's absolutely right, Alan. And 
but no other medium. Uh, just print. Just print. So I couldn't call you that. No, but, but I... you could fax me. Right. <laughs> Or indeed, scribble it down on a piece of paper and hold it up to your face. That would be perfectly legal, yes. yes. <laughs> and people do do that. Right. Conrad, can I ask you about the McCarthy era? Um, it was a very sticky patch in your career. I wonder if you could eliminate it for us. Well, I wouldn't say it was a sticky patch. It was a time when one had to stick to one's principles, and I did. It was because at the time you were under a lot of pressure, as were many people. You were called before the uh, House Committee of Un-American Activities. Um, yes, I was. Before Senator Joseph McCarthy. Very intimidating man. You certainly were. And I remember hearing the tape. He asked you, he said, will you name any people who you knew to be members of the Communist Party? And you said... Humphrey Bogart. Charles Chaplin, <laughs> Arthur Miller, Elia Kazan, John Houston, well John done. Ford, well Fincham, done. Charlie Chaplin, especially. I've always I heard about him being a communist, and uh, whenever I watch those films like Gold Rush, you know, and see him walking along, that walk seems sinister somehow. <laughs> the walk seems to be saying, yes. "Be a communist." <laughs> you did the series of dinosaur films, didn't you? Yes. Now, they were rubbish, weren't they? <laughs> well, Alan, one of them won an Oscar. Yeah, best use of an animated dinosaur. <laughs> well, I, I've done better work, of course. But have you? <laughs> well, I have my business interests. Would you want to tell us about those? What are, the, what, what are your business interests? Conrad Knight Socks. What, 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 what's that? They're very distinctive socks. They Conrad have, Knight socks. They have a, a special kind of crest. Uh, it's, a, it's Conrad's historical family crest, which I designed myself. Um, <laughs> Conrad Knight socks. Hang on a second, you're advertising. Conrad Knight socks. All right. Put a Conrad Knight sock in it. <laughs> Conrad... Shut up! <laughs> Now, 1991 was an annus horribilis for you two, wasn't it? Conrad, you had a massive heart attack. <laughs> Sally, that was a terrible year for you as well. You, had a, you had a total nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your nerves collapsed completely, didn't they? <laughs> How did you cope? Kendall, it was very tough. The important thing is that what we experienced then was a tremendous outpouring of love and emotion yes. from friends and fans. Beautiful. Please I have a do. letter here. May I read this letter? Please, oh, please. do read the letter. Uh, is it long? Letter. It's very, very brief oh, and good. very beautiful. It's it a must. letter that was from a little old lady in Updike, Massachusetts, specifically about Conrad's illness, and it simply says this. It says, Dear Conrad and Sally, I have heard that Conrad is very ill. I do not know either of you, but I know your work, and I value you. I feel as though I love you both. I have, I'm sorry. I have very little left to live for, and if you die, I will have nothing. Please, Conrad, don't die. And it's just, I'm sorry. It's just it's a very beautiful letter, and it was the kind of thing that... And I How wrote to back to her. <laughs> and I wrote, Dear old lady, thank you for your terrific and moving letter, and we love you. Please, don't die. <laughs> and I enclosed with the letter a pair of Conrad Knight socks. <laughs> To cheer her up. It was a lovely gesture. Did, did she write back? <laughs> no. She died. <laughs> Why? Why do people have to die? The important thing is, <laughs> it's a That's wonderful right. thing. Um... <laughs> We're back. I think we should wind no, up now. No, 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 this is... You're listening to Alan Partridge. This is a beautiful moment of emotional outpouring. This is a transatlantic sea of tears. 
that you're hearing now on Radio 4. Um, right, um, over to you, Kendall. I believe that you two have a little surprise for Alan. We do, Kendall. Um, we'd like to sing a little song for you. Oh, oh well, thank you. And Would that be more all right? of a surprise, Alan. You're going to sing with us. Oh, oh yeah. I, I can't sing. Yeah. Yes, you can. <laughs> Okay. I know you better than I know myself. Thank you, you're very kind. Oh, so much better than I know myself. She lost, you know. I know the tricks you play. What tricks? I've seen them every day. No wonder I'm bored. Bored? No wonder I'm mad. Conrad no wonder I'm sauce. crazy <laughs> over you. That's Welcome to Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> I'm at home. <laughs> in Vegas. This makes you putting me off That's the town where I belong. What a you can bet, oh yeah, you bet, on Vegas. The only town to move me to song. I have seen the best. Robust. North, south, east and west. Robust. From Shanghai to Timbuktu. That's quite far away. In Vegas. Yes, and I'm at home in Vegas too. Thanks for being on, knowing me and knowing you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, would you all whoa, now... Whoa, 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 whoa. I start. <laughs> <laughs> knock, knock. <laughs> Alan. Alan who? Alan Partridge. <laughs> now, you've probably guessed I'm not a comedian. <laughs> but our second guest most definitely is. Now, he learned his comedy skills in the Catskills. He's got belly laughs in the Borscht Belt, and every time he comes to Las Vegas, he's a surefire comedy winner. Twice, my... th twice this week... <laughs> I've shouted, book him! Once, when I was commentating on a football or soccer match, as you say, and Stuart Pearce committed a particularly nasty foul, and I shouted, book him! The second time was when I was uh, having a meal last night in the Hotel Carvery, and I saw a very talented New York Jewish comedian, and I shouted, book him! <laughs> His name is Bernie Rosen... So please welcome Bernie Rosen! <laughs> knowing me, Alan Partridge. Knowing me, Kendall Ball. Knowing us, Alan Partridge and Kendall Ball. Knowing you, Bernie Rosen, aha. Uh -huh. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, knowing me, but obviously not in the biblical sense. Huh? <laughs> Though uh, we live in hope, eh, Kendall? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Who are these people here? You know, I, they, they, they all look so depressed, you know. I mean, that's the thing about Vegas. You know, we Jews, we've lost so much money here in Vegas. We call it Oi Vegas, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I mean, look, look, look at that woman over there, you know. Look at that lady there. She, she looks like she's just got here from a funeral, you know, her own. Yeah. <laughs> Bernie, uh, Bernie, yeah, I noticed I, the way you came in I, was, like, full of confidence and full schmazz. Marks there, and that's Kendall. That's, is your comedy a sort of defence mechanism? No, no, can we just... I don't want to get too heavy. Look, <laughs> Bernie, 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 yeah, Alan, who's your favourite comedian? Uh, well, I suppose i got to say Milton Boyle, you know? I, who's he? <laughs> well, he's my favourite comedian, you know? Right. Uh, who's your favourite British comedian that people in Britain might have heard of? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Alan. You know... Tommy Cooper? No. Tommy Cooper? No, I, I, oh, come I, I, on, he did tricks badly. You know, he died at the Palladium. Hey. <laughs> Alan, 
I tell you something, we've all died at the Palladium, you know. <laughs> what, what, what's your favourite situation comedy? Ah, yeah, uh, My Marriage is my favourite sitcom, you know. We're on to our 22nd series, the ratings are terrible, you know, uh, and the good news is uh, they're riding my wife out of the next series. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, I'm, I'm sure you're a very funny man. <laughs> But you never answer the question. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should hear my cousin Morris, the Latin accountant. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, you just answered the question. No, Alan, Alan. What's your favourite sitcom? The Golden Goyles. Right, right. Mine is Robin's Nest. <laughs> It was, it was brilliant, actually. Richard O'Sullivan uh, ran this restaurant, and it really was chaos. It was... I mean, and uh, the man who did the washing up only had one arm. <laughs> when you think about it, it's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, need, need, needless to say that plenty of plates got broken and uh, Robin got annoyed. <laughs> right. It was very funny. Now, let's move on. Let's not beat about the bush. You are a Jew. Oh, Alan, <laughs> hey, you said you wouldn't tell anybody. The secret's out. What do you mean? Everyone knows. <laughs> it's a joke, Alan. You know, I was joking. All right, you, know, you were very funny last night. I... Yeah, well, you know... It, look, in... <laughs> you see, in Britain, there's a rich stream of Jewish comedy. There's uh, all, all the famous ones. Shylock, Fagin, Topol... <laughs> Maureen Lippmann in the, in the British Telecom ads, which depicts modern Jews accurately and hilariously. <laughs> But, of course, there are different kinds of Jews, aren't there? Oh, sure, yeah, sure, Alan. You know, we got we got conservative Jews, we got reformed Jews, liberal Jews, orange Jews, apple Jews. Uh, ap know. Apple Jews? Uh, what, what are they? <laughs> no, Alan, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a joke, Alan. It was Jews, Jews, you know, it sounds... Did, you do, did you do that joke in your act? No, I, I wrote it for tonight, yeah. Well, you shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> yeah. Bernie, could I ask you a question? Keep it light. <laughs> How do you deal with anti-Semitism in your profession? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> could I answer I that? No, I don't want to get into this whole dangerous area of anti-Semitism. I, I, look, please, Bernie, for God's sake, please... Tell us a joke about Jews. <laughs> OK, OK, Alan, I'll tell you a Jewish joke. Uh, I, I said to my wife, Ida, Ida, how come you never tell me when you orgasm? And she said to me, Boyne, it's cos you're never there. <laughs> you know, when, when I orgasm, you're never there, you know. You, it's, you know, it, I... Hang I said, on, hang I, on, hang on. Ah, oh, yes, yes! Yes! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah! OK, we have contact, OK. That's good. I've got a great uh, joke about Jews. Oh, yeah. um, right, um, um, did you hear about the Jewish hotel keeper? He, he kept a fork in the sugar bowl, for goodness sake. No, uh, Alan, that's not a Jewish joke. No, that's Alan, an that's... anti Jewish that joke. That stereotypes Jewish people as being mean. Well, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't want to say you were mean. I mean, in fact, I noticed when I met you tonight, the very first thing you did when we met in the bar, you went and bought me a drink. And I, rem I remember you did that, and I thought, yes, yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> It's very nice of you, Alan, but the important thing is not to generalise. You know, yeah. I've, I, I've just met you. You're the only person I know from where are you from, Norwich. Norwich. Yeah, and, and just knowing you, I'm not going to think that everyone in Norwich is... is... Stupid. <laughs> People aren't stupid in Norwich. I, was, I wasn't saying they you, were stupid. You, no, let me nail this ghost to the coffin <laughs> once and for all. <laughs> Norwich people are not stupid. Let me tell you something. Let me tell this American audience something. In Britain... We have centres of excellence. Oxford, Cambridge and Norwich. <laughs> sure. And people in Norwich are different. Living in Norwich is not just a way of life. Norwich is an attitude. <laughs> and I will not have that kind of prejudice <laughs> thrown upon me from, from someone like that's the disgrace. Thank you very much for your interview. You were so funny last night. Do I, do I go now? Yeah, give him a round of applause. <laughs> Bernie Rosen, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Bernie! Woo Our final 
guest tonight is not so much famous as infamous. He's known throughout Las Vegas as one of the biggest high-rolling gamblers of them all. Rianne Nuvaplu. Place your bets. The dice are loaded. Stick or twist. Two fat ladies, 88. Legs 11. <laughs> 11. <laughs> all these words are music to his ears. Please welcome Mr. I'll R say this. Please welcome Mr. Risky Business himself, professional gambler, Jack the Black Cat Colson. Woo! <laughs> Knowing me, Alan Partridge. Knowing me, Kendall Ball. Knowing us, Alan Partridge and Kendall Ball. Knowing you, Jack the Black Cat Colson. Aha. <laughs> That's just about the longest introduction I ever had. <laughs> Aha, I thought you'd never gonna finish it. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack, I believe that you have played poker with Telly Savalas. Tell That's us about right. Who loves you, baby? <laughs> Tess Vass, he's a real keen poker player. He heard I was in Vegas. He was shooting some film here. He said, Jack Black Cat, how'd you, how'd you want to play a bit of poker? High stakes. Yeah. Book him, Dano. Murder one. <laughs> nope, ma'am. That's the Y50. Wrong. Tell him never said that. Okay. Anyhow, Teddy comes up to my hotel room. We, I say, Teddy, you want to play a little bit of Texas Holden? You know Texas Holden? Yeah. Game? Deal comes. Mm -hmm. Telly's got a pair of kings. I got bullets in the hole, aces. Oh. And now I don't know. I figure I'm going to get Telly all in here. Ooh. Flop comes, uh -oh. deuce, tray, five. Ain't no use to neither of us. Right. Wow. Telly raises the max. I call. Fifth oh. Street comes to turn. Whoa. Guess what happens? Four club comes down there. I just wow. made me an inside straight. Hit middle pin. Woo! Oh, hey. Telly says to me, Well, what you got, Jack Black? Oh. And I flip over my aces. I say, Telly, I got bullets. Pow, pow. You shot Telly Savalas. <laughs> no, Alan, bullets at slang for aces. It, it, it's funny, though, isn't it, that his name's Telly Savalas and he's on the telly. <laughs> it's a little funny. Bit, bit, it's a bit like me being called uh, Radio Partridge. <laughs> Which, of course, is, is not that funny when you think about it, because there was uh, Radio Caroline, isn't there? <laughs> The name. Jack, tell us about your famous roulette system. You've been practicing it since the age of six. The thing about roulette, anyone out there listening to this, you don't want to play roulette. It's suckers games, see? You get all these people, they fly over to Vegas, they say, hey, I got some big, big shot roulette system. Only a sucker got a roulette system. I've got a roulette system. <laughs> you want to tell I've, us about it? I've got a foolproof system. Uh -huh. I developed it uh, when I was coming over on the playing club class. And uh, I've tried it out several times now in my imagination, and it works every time. I can believe it. It is how it works, right? But it's not the toss of a coin. Look, if, you, if I toss a coin and it's heads, the next time I toss it, it's bound to be tails. <laughs> nope, it's 50-50 every single time. Our coin ain't got a brain, ain't got consciousness. No matter what's going on around the coin, the coin just does what the hell it wants to do. A bit like yourself, Alan. Well, I... <laughs> I bet you any money that if I put my system into practice, it would work. I bet you. Well, I may just have to take you up on that little bit, Al. Well, you could just take me up on that. Well, I may just do that. Well, you could do it if you want. Well, I may just do it. Do it. Watch yourself, Alan. Hang on, hang on. If you knows what he's doing. You want to make a bet? Thousand bucks. I think that your Texan belly's going a little bit yellow. You do. Well, yes. let's do it, Alan. Thousand bucks. Tough thousand point. bucks. Woo, let's woo, woo, woo. do it, Alan. Yeah, thousand bucks. Call. Sales. What's that? Sales, yes! <laughs> One thousand dollars to me. Check? Who do you want me to make check payable to? Make it payable to Great Ormond Street Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, you want to raise the stakes a little bit, Alan? Put it up to 5,000 bucks? Jack, he's uh, no, so fucked. No, no. No. <laughs> no, 10,000. 10,000 10, bucks. bucks. Yeah. I like the way you're speaking, Alan. 10,000 bucks. 10,000 bucks. Yes. Call. Heads. What's that? Heads, yes! <laughs> yes! 10,000 bucks. Live 
from Las Vegas, it's Alan Partridge, just won 10,000 bucks off supposedly the greatest gambler who's ever lived. <laughs> Check here, payable to Great Ormond Street No, just Hospital. leave that blank. I'll fill that out. <laughs> but, uh, thanks, yes, I'm not. Thanks for being on the show, and uh, thanks for being so gracious My in your, pleasure, uh, Alan. In your uh, humiliating defeat. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know me, Alan, don't matter to me. I lose 11,000 bucks, have a little bit of fun. I still drive home in my brand-new $140,000 red Mercedes sports car. Really? Just drive on home in You've my got Mercedes a... sports car. Well... Here's the big question, buddy boy. Alan, don't even think no. about it. How do you fancy betting your $140,000 worth of German hardware against £20,000 worth of pure maroon Ford Granada Sport? You got it, Alan. Car. Tails. What's that? Heads. <laughs> Give me the keys, Alan. Hang on, no, you can't. Give oh, me the please. keys, Alan. That's my car. Give me the keys, Alan. That's my car, you can't. Just give me the keys. Best out of three. <laughs> please, Ain't best no out best of three, three Alan. You took a bet. Just give me the keys. Uh, can I have a chance to win it back? What you got, Alan? Do you know what a Nissan Micra is? <laughs> Shit, a little Japanese car. It's a Japanese hatchback. I don't want that. I have access to one. <laughs> I... Whose it's, car it's is it? It's my wife's car. Go, Alan, don't do that. Go, Alan, Alan, I gamble. seriously... Go, you go. go. your nose, babe. <laughs> yes. Ooh, big boy. Come on, yes. Come on, Slow please. Partridge. Nissan Micra. Yeah. You go. Car. Tails. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> on that bombshell. <laughs> on that... On that double vehicular loss. For Alan Partridge in Vegas, it's time to say... I can't say it. You do it, Kendall. Well, you have been knowing us, Kendall Ball and Alan Partridge, knowing you, Jack the Black Cat Coulson, Bernie Rosen, Conrad Knight and Sally Hawk. Thanks to our team of researchers, David Schneider, Rebecca Franz, Dune McKeon, Patrick Marber and Steve Coogan. The producer was Armando Iannucci. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome once again to Knowing Me, Knowing You with Alan Partridge. Aha. Aha. Now, the more observant listeners may have noticed that that last aha was tinged with sadness. And that's because this is the last in the current series of Knowing Me, Knowing You. Aha. No, aha. <laughs> Now, after this show, the BBC have told me to clear my desk, pack my bags and hop it! <laughs> no, of course they haven't. <laughs> They're uh, currently in negotiations for a second series. Uh, basically, they say that uh, the deal's fine as it stands. We say things change. <laughs> we say in this business, people become hot. <laughs> when you're handling something that's hot, you don't want to get your fingers burnt. So you wear oven gloves. <laughs> and you handle that hot property with kid gloves. And, and oven gloves outside, outside the kid gloves. Um, to sum up, in case anyone's not quite sure what I'm saying, uh, what I'm actually trying to say is that BBC TV are on the lookout for the next big TV chat show. Um, fingers. I'm actually trying to say um, TV's gain could be Radio 4's loss. <laughs> OK, let's get on with the show. Let's uh, banish all talk of knowing me, knowing you, being a central component of next autumn's BBC One schedule. <laughs> My first guest tonight is the commissioning director for BBC Television. Please give a warm welcome to Mr Tony Hayes. <laughs> Knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Tony Hayes. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tony Hayes, commissioning director 
of BBC television. <laughs> Alan Partridge, presenter of Radio 4's Jewel in the Crown. Yeah. No, no, it's knowing me, knowing me. <laughs> I, I meant Jewel in the Crown. It's not as called the... Jewel in the Crown. No, it's another thing. <laughs> Let's move on. Right, yeah, of course. Now, in a short while, you will be taking telephone calls from members of the public... That's right. Um, ..who want to know questions about BBC television. That's why you're on the show, and yes. we look forward to that. Yes. Now, there is an ethos behind the BBC. Yes. So, what is that? We've always, and always will be, committed to, to making programmes of originality, quality and excellence. I can see that, because I go home, I sit down, I turn the television on, Mm. onto BBC One, and I sit and watch The Darling Buds of May, mm. and, I, and I say, thank God for the BBC. This is quality. Uh, well, that's very kind, Alan. I have to say that Darling Buds of May is actually ITV. Was is it? Oh, right. Well, um, um, Inspector Morse, then. <laughs> ITV. Right, OK. Uh, the Bill? The Bill? ITV. Right. Um, <laughs> Noel's House Party. <laughs> Yes, that's us, Alan, yes. <laughs> okay. right, fine, so I like to go home, sit down, and think, I want originality, quality and excellence. I watch Noel's House Party, <laughs> and I think, thank God for the BBC. <laughs> originality, quality and excellence. Yes. Noel's House Party. <laughs> It's interesting. Actually, you say the Darling Buds of May, um, because I remember now that the BBC was offered that show yes, and turned correct. it down. That's correct, yes. So someone, somewhere along the line, let 20 million viewers <laughs> slip through his fingers. He must be kicking himself now. <laughs> that was me. It's rubbish, though. <laughs> It's rubbish, though, isn't it? It's, uh... Well, I thought it was very good. It I is, it is. It's, it's great. It's perfect, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you just said it was rubbish, Alan. Yeah, it is rubbish. The, the viewing figures, the, they're 20 million. They can't be that much. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. But, uh, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I think it's time for the first caller, which is Steve from Hornsey in North London. Steve, are you there? Yeah, I am, Alan. Hello. Have you got a question for Tony Hayes? Yeah, uh, Tony. Hello, Hello. Steve. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm a big fan of Duchess of Duke Street. <laughs> the uh, Duchess of Duke Street. Right. Uh, right. I'm just wondering, are you going to bring that back? Are you going to have a repeat for that? Um, there, I must confess there aren't any firm plans at the moment, but it, I, I was a big fan of the series. I'm pleased to hear that it's fondly remembered in the public's eye, and um, I guess I'll do my best to see for the future. Actually, you could possibly get it on video. Is it available on video? No, I don't think so. You could try the BBC shop, but yeah. I'm not sure myself. Oh, well, I hope, I hope that helps you, Steve. Yeah. Can Is I ask you a question, Alan? Certainly, far away. Why are you such a tit? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we do... We can't... <laughs> we, we've, we've no control over that, so I apologise in advance. You yeah. haven't answered a question! Why has it been cut off? You should have been cut off! <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, the next is... Kelly from Withington. Kelly? Hello. 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 Kelly. Kerry. Kerry, sorry. Why haven't you got more youth programmes? What? What? Why aren't there more youth programmes? Why aren't there more youth programmes? Um, well, Kerry, um, that's an area of programming that we're addressing at the moment. We have a youth controller and um, we hope that within the next few years we'll really have tackled programming for the 15 to 25 year old age bracket. Great, and, and uh, I'd like to think that Knowing Me, Knowing You is in there with the youth programs because uh, Simon Bates is a big fan of the show and uh, <laughs> he's certainly got his finger on the nub of youth. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, and indeed Kerry's called, so I imagine she's a listener. Kerry, do you like the show? No. Right, OK. <laughs> All right. Um, fine. Uh, the next call is Amanda, Amanda Southampton from Southampton. Are you there? It's just Amanda from Southampton. OK. Have you got a question, have you got a question for Tony? Yes, hello, Tony. Hello, Amanda. Um, I listen uh, regularly to Radio 4, mm -hmm. and um, I heard all of Knowing Me, Knowing You as a consequence. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just want to say that um, 
It's the most insidiously offensive program that I've ever heard. Um, right. I don't know how much of it you've heard, but um, um, Alan Partridge, if I can just say, has on air, to my knowledge, hit a child. Mm. He's gambled away his wife's car. Um, he has taken cocaine, um, bribed rent boys. Um, he was openly homophobic to um, a gay lawyer. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Nick um, Ford. Nick Ford. <laughs> Um, patronising to all his women mm. guests. Oh, look, have you got a question, dearie? <laughs> well, it's more, really more of a plea, Mr. Hares. Um, yes. Just please don't let Alan Partridge on the television. <laughs> Well, Amanda, I'm not responsible for radio, so... Tony, if I, can I deal with this, please? Listen, listen, love, in the cut and thrust... In the cut and thrust of a chat show, people are going to get hit. <laughs> you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, think, I imagine that's a hoax caller, probably uh, wife of the, uh, of the tip man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got time for... We've got time for one more call, which is... From uh, John in Norwich. Hello, John. Hello, Alan. I listen to Knowing Me, Knowing You a lot. I'm a big yes, fan, John. and I think it should definitely go to television. Right. Um, it could be made very cheaply by Pear Tree Productions, which <laughs> is Alan Partridge's company, I believe. That's right. They could make it at Anglia Studios in Norwich. Yes. Uh, very mm. cheaply, Anglia Studios. Uh, I understand has excellent online editing facilities <laughs> and digital editing equipment as well, right. which would be useful for television. And it, I reckon you could probably bring in a show for about £75,000, which in TV terms is very cheap, so you'd have quality programming for a cheap budget. He's got a well, point. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you, John. I, um, I, I'll bear all that in well, mind. That's very interesting. Is, is that all, John? Is that all you've got to say? Anything else? Um, Format? The format, because, <laughs> because... Because it would be transferring direct from radio, you wouldn't have to pay Pear Tree Productions a large development fee. It mm -hmm. could just transfer straight away. I mean, Alan could start broadcasting as of next week, if you wanted. <laughs> Can I just ask, John, what do you do for a living? I'm a plumber. Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. Jason from Norwich. There. John. John from Norwich, a plumber. OK, well, uh, thanks very much, Tony Hayes. Uh, give a round of applause, Tony Hayes! <laughs> now, my next two guests. Well, one is a TV presenter whose bark is worse than her bite. The other is a fashion designer whose style leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> and now they're both branching out. <laughs> Why have I kept mentioning bits of trees and stuff like that? Well, this year is the year of the tree. And my next guests are two enterprising, stylish ladies who are launching a celebrity tree planting event to raise public awareness about the plight of our trees. Come with me and get to know Trudy Skye and Yvonne Boyd. Knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Trudy Sky and Yvonne Boyd, aha. Uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Now, if I can get my teeth into Trudy first. Trudy, <laughs> you are known chiefly as presenter of the show on BBC Two's Deaf Leopard. No, uh, Deaf Two. Right, you present Deaf 2 on Deaf Leopard. No, I present my show, The Show, on Deaf 2. Right. Now, for the benefit of my listeners, uh, tell us briefly as possible about The Show. Well, it's very much a cult thing. Small uh, viewing figures, carry on. <laughs> well, it's a sort of multimedia um, potpourri, if you like, of uh, music, art, dance, cabaret, culture, floating sculpture. Um, and it's, it sort of aims at teenagers with, like, a four-second attention span. Yeah. Well, I have to say, my teenage children, Fernando and Denise, are avid, 
avid watchers. I, on the other hand, find it completely exhausting. Um, it's so fast. I thought our telly was on the blink, it was changing all the time. Well, it's very much in your face, Telly. Yes, I did feel it in my face, yes. <laughs> yeah, I thought my head was going to explode, like, uh, like in that film. Um, <laughs> Let me move on to you, Yvonne Boyd. You are a fashion designer, but you don't design clothes that ordinary people would wear in the street. You design more kind of outlandish, sort of funny-looking clown-type costume things. <laughs> I mean, I really think that all clothes are a statement. I mean, my bank manager couldn't wear one of your clown costumes, for example. Well, why not? Because he'd look ridiculous. <laughs> look like a clown. Yes, but, I mean, what I would say to you is, would you say that he looked ridiculous if he was wearing, like, um, a long bit of striped cotton with flaps around the neck and wrist and, and maybe a bit of brightly coloured silk around the neck? Yes, that would look silly. <laughs> right, so you would think that he looked silly in a shirt and tie. Ah, oh, I see. Very clever. <laughs> Yeah. OK, my bank manager looks stupid, right, and you look normal wearing what I can only describe as a shrub on your head. It is a shrub. It's my shrub hat. And the statement you're making, presumably, is I'm wearing a shrub on my head. All clothes, as I said, are a statement of something, so what I'm wearing is a statement, and what you're mm. wearing now, which is... Um, a, a, a sort of future and sage Pringle jumper with um, <laughs> with the golfer design knitted into Thank it. Thank you. Um, that also is making a statement. I mean, that is saying, you know, I am a performer. Look, look, I'm bright and exciting. Right. Well, yes, it is. It is. I mean, it's saying, I'm Alan Partridge. I am sports casual. <laughs> um, I mean... How would you describe me as a figure? What would you say I was? I would say that you were a, a sort of Rococo figure, a, a kind of mock Baroque, if you like. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Name me, Alan Partridge, mock Baroque. <laughs> Knowing you, Yvonne Boyd, tree lady. <laughs> now... Now, the reason why you're both here is to promote your tree campaign. Trudy, tell us about that. Well, Tree Naissance 93 is a sort of... <laughs> it's a sort of massive tree-planting eco-drive to raise consciousness. And what we're saying, basically, is germination, not termination. We're saying... <laughs> we're saying sapling, not grappling. We're saying nurture, not torture. Great. I've got a good one for you. Um, I thought of it up in the car on the way, the way down. Uh, build a tree! Don't cut it down, for goodness sake. <laughs> Put that on a T-shirt. Um, now, when, when did you first get the idea for Tree Naissance 93? Well, it was actually on one of our hen runs. Um, right. Oh, yes, the infamous hen runs. Tell us about those. Well, it's uh, once a month, about 30 of us girlies get together and go on a coach trip at sort right. of women only, just to sort of crazy Who, and exciting What kind of people places. go on these trips? Oh, just friends, you know, Yasmin Lebon, Annie Lennox, Katie Puckrick. Juliet um, Stevenson. Yeah, yeah, Faye Weld and Janet Street Porter. Pamela yeah. Stevenson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Zoe yeah. Heller, the Chumleys. Yeah, yeah, I get the picture. No, that lot, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the, the day that it sort of rose in our collective psyche was... Um, when you got the idea. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was uh, an outing to Margate where we had a wonderful day and uh, we actually just chanced upon this incredible greasy calf on the seafront. It was really it was, extraordinary. It was so kitsch. It was like... Uh, I can't describe it. There were, like, dirty tablecloths and the floor was filthy and the waiter was Italian. The waiter had actually been born in Italy and he'd come over here to work as a waiter. Really? Amazing. <laughs> Um, on every table they had like plastic red tomatoes which you squeezed and, and you got tomato ketchup out of them but they looked like a sort of Robert Rauschenberg um, they were sort of they were too big for themselves and uh, they inspired Yvonne to launch her tomato collection which was sort of plastic red puffball dresses with a stomach design of a green nozzle <laughs> something else for my bank manager to wear <laughs> But to get back to the original question, 
Tell me about Tree Naissance. I suppose it was a very wacky do and everyone was really trendy. Presumably, uh, you went dressed as a, 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 a banana or something like that. All no, bent. I went wearing what I'm wearing now, part of my tree collection. You went wearing what, what you're wearing now. I hope you change your underwear. <laughs> Don't wear underwear. Of course you do. No, I don't. You, you don't. do. You're just trying to be wacky. I'm not being wacky. I don't approve of underwear. I see it as a f restriction of personal freedom, and I've never worn it. And that's all the dash. I Everyone wears not underwear. Not you don't. Do. You I'm do. not lying. You don't wear... call me a liar. Yeah, you do. do. Right. I'll show you. Don't, no, don't do that. Don't. Do, no. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> God, I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> I just can still see it. That's atrocious. She, ladies and gentlemen, she just showed me her woman's area. <laughs> Thank goodness it's radio. I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> really? That was atrocious. If you go around calling people liars on your show, then you've got to expect you, people to show their veracity. You will not show your veracity <laughs> on my show. I just want to say, if, anyone, if anyone's listening to this, I had no idea that they were going to be so candid. <laughs> and to make quite clear my abhorrence, I now will tell them to leave. <laughs> and in addition to that, I will ask the audience to boo them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tudy Sky and Yvonne Boyd. Good night. Boo them. <laughs> boo them. Go on. Boo them. That's right. And hiss them. <laughs> right. Now, my final guest tonight <laughs> is an 84-year-old man. <laughs> During his long, distinguished, maverick political career, he's been famous for his outspoken views and the outspoken way of speaking them. In 1963... <laughs> He reduced interviewer David Frost to a gibbering wreck of tears. In a recent TV debate with feminist Andrea Dworkin, he caused outrage when he told her to shut up and shave. <laughs> and, only, and only last week, he sensationally renounced his peerage and left the House of Lords. I'd better watch out, and so would you, as we get to know Lord Morgan of Glossop. <laughs> knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Lord Morgan of Glossop, aha. <laughs> no. No, you're not going to do that, okay. <laughs> Now, you've just resigned from the House of Lords. Do you want to tell us about that? One week ago, I stood up in the House of Lords and I said, my lords and ladies, you're all asses. Goodbye. <laughs> Great. Um, you've just published your autobiography. What's that about? It's about my life, you ask. <laughs> yeah. um, you, 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 you describe your childhood in, in the book, and, and I imagine your life uh, in Glossop in Derbyshire, I imagine a life of cobbly streets, of inclement weather, a wholesome existence. Is that fair? When I was five, <laughs> I walked into the parlour and I witnessed my father shooting my mother. <laughs> he then placed the shotgun into his own mouth and blew his brains out. So it wasn't an idyllic childhood. <laughs> On the contrary, I was spared the ridiculous hypocrisy of family life. The only friend a man needs is the bottle. Right. <laughs> no doubt, then, uh, if you're so fond of the bottle, you'll be quite pleased that we uh, left a bottle of ten-year-old malt in your dressing room. Yes, it's all gone. You... <laughs> Do you enjoy it? Piss. <laughs> you can see why 
David Frost started crying. <laughs> He's an ass. No. Well, I won't ask what I am. You're an ass. Huh. So, uh, after uh, after childhood, what happened then? Adolescence. <laughs> And uh, um, what what was that like? Like childhood, but with more pubic hair. I got you there. Yes. <laughs> what did it? Oh. Now you are. Please, please. please. Now, Lord Morgan, please. People are listening. Now, in Oxford, in the 1930s, you went up to Oxford to study the classics, and it was there you met W.H. Auden, puff. Stephen Spencer, <laughs> Cecil, Cecil Day Lewis. Big puff. Now, you, 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 didn't, you didn't like them, did you? Nancy boy, communist puff to perks. Really. <laughs> Little puffy poets prancing right. around. Yeah, okay. So you didn't like them? You ass. Oh, don't say that again, please. please. If you don't want me to say it again, I won't say it again. I'll give right. you my word. Are you a man of your word? Nope. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, you've been very outspoken. You're in favour of hanging. You're only for criminals. <laughs> A man chooses to do in the privacy of his own attic. <laughs> it's his business alone. Right, but what about the feminist argument that pornography degrades women? But is it not the case that sex degrades women? If it's any good. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, now, <coughs> now, you're you're in Who's Who, and uh, I, I think... like those prostitutes. I'm sorry. I like those prostitutes. They were very nice. Who? What prostitutes? Those prostitutes you had on before. They were, were like they? Yeah, they were guests. You can't say that. They were guests. They looked like whores. Don't say that. Whores. Don't. Well, they look, did. Look, look. I, I, you, and I know they look like whores. You <laughs> can't say that. <clears throat> now, I would love to be in Who's Who, and um, I, I've what I've got here is my entry for Who's Who, as follows. Oh. <clears throat> Alan Gordon Partridge, <laughs> born April the 2nd, 1955, <clears throat> Norwich. <clears throat> Journalist, commentator, broadcaster and interviewer for Anglia TV's oh. Sport Report, on the hour, BBC Radio 4, host of own chat show, <laughs> knowing me, knowing you, Radio 4 and others. Is that the sort of thing that would be an acceptable form of words with which to grace the hallowed turf of who's who's pages? <laughs> no? I, um, I see that your own entry, your list, your hobbies, uh, food, whiskey, and your attic. I mean, do you eat often? <laughs> Lord Morgan. <laughs> Lord Morgan? Can we have the chief? Can we have the chief medical officer, please? <laughs> Sorry, just I, I'm very worried. Is there anything at all? I'm afraid his pulse has completely stopped. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. I'll deal with this. I'll deal with this. Yeah, I'll deal with this. <laughs> um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's <clears throat> it's with great regret that I have to announce that Lord Morgan of Glossop. Passed away peacefully some moments ago. Um, and on that bombshell... On that bomb... No, we can't. I can't do that. <laughs> this, no, this, no this, this is a profound moment. Uh, the only thing is, is, is that we perhaps observe a minute's silence. In fact, I, I ought to cover him. Um, I'll... <laughs> Just, I'm taking my sweater off. I'm just going to break it over his head. <laughs> so, I, I drape my sweater over his head to 
preserve some dignity. As, as Lord Morgan sits immovable beneath the hastily improvised Pringle Shroud. It seems, it seems somehow appropriate to say, this is knowing me, Alan Partridge, knowing you, Lord Morgan, rest in peace. Aha. <laughs> well, please, please, one, one minute silence, starting now. Please, stop whatever you're doing if you're in the car, pull over. If you're on the motorway, please pull in at the next service station and observe a minute's silence in your own time. <laughs> Um, if you're on the M1, there's Scratchwood, Toddington, <laughs> and Newport Pagnell, <laughs> where you'll find a country kitchen. <laughs> um, if you're on the M6, you've got <laughs> Knutsford, Sandback, and Hilton Park. So, a minute's silence. I'll have to speak periodically to <laughs> show us all broadcasting. This is Radio 4. <laughs> with Alan Partridge. Um, drivers on the M4, you might, might want to pull off at Chippenham, where, uh, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, you'll find a Julie's Pantry. <laughs> Minute silence. But in fact, I think we're running out of time. I'm sure Lord Morgan um, wouldn't mind if I encroached on his minute silence to read out the credits. Um, I'd like to thank my guests, Tony Hayes, Judy Sky, Yvonne Boyd, my team of writers and researchers, Steve Coogan, Patrick Marber, Rebecca Front, Dune McKeegan, David Schneider, and my producer, Armando Iannucci. And um, on this very sombre bombshell. <laughs> I wish you all good night. <laughs>